So welcome to the uh, Town of Deerfield uh, Select Board Board of Health and Sewer Commissioners meeting for January 11th, 2023. Happy New Year, everybody. Um, the time is 5 p.m., 5.04 p.m. This meeting will be held in a hybrid fashion with the opportunity for both in-person attendance and remote participation in accordance with the Chapter 107 of the Acts of 2022, which extended the governor's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the Open Meeting Law, Mass General Law, Chapter 30A, Section 20, until March 31st, 2023. Please note that while an option for... I'm sorry... Please note that while an option for um, an option for remote attendance or participation is being provided as a courtesy to the public, the meeting or hearing will not be suspended or terminated if technical problems interrupt the virtual broadcast unless otherwise required by law. Members of the public with particular interest in any specific item on this agenda should make plans for in-person versus virtual attendance accordingly. For purposes of in-person attendance, the Town of Deerfield will host the meeting in the main meeting room of the Deerfield Municipal Offices with remote participation detail below, which um, is always found on our agendas, which can be found on the Town of Deerfield's website near the calendar. Um, you just click on that link and you'll find the agenda. If you'd like to dial in, the uh, toll-free number is 833-548-0276. The meeting ID is 911-604. 1580 and the passcode is 570012. There's also a link to this Zoom meeting, which many have found and are on. Um, meeting attendees should mute their phones unless asking questions or commenting. Um, all attendees should wait to speak until other participants are finished. And if you'd like on landlines, uh, you can mute your phones by hitting star six. So I'll call the meeting to order. Uh, the first agenda uh, item is an executive session. So I'll read the um, executive session note. Um, pursuant to uh, general law chapter 30A, section 21A3, and subject to the chair's declaration and a roll call vote, the select board may meet in an executive session to discuss strategy for litigation, uh, Judith Rathborn, the Deerfield Planning Board and Deerfield Select Board, Superior Court Civil Docket number 2278CV0032, Judith Rathburn, uh, born v. Town of Deerfield et al., Superior Court, Civil Docket, number 2278CV00037. If an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on litigation position of the town. Uh, as a chair, I do so declare, and I'll entertain a motion to enter in. I make that motion, Carolyn. Okay, okay. and then I, uh, in, in this motion, I am inviting in um, uh, Chief John Paturik, um, Attorney James Martin, Attorney Lisa Mead, and us, uh, Town Administrator Casey Warren. Do I have a second? Uh, yes, and I'll second that. Okay. You're going to have, uh, excuse me, Mr. Chair, you'd have uh, Attorney Jay Tallerman in too. Oh, we do. Okay, great. Thank you. And we'll also invite Attorney Jay Tallerman. Thank you for, for that. Um, information. So um, we, have, we have a second. All those in favor? Roll call vote. Tim Hilchey, aye. Trevor McDaniel, aye. Carolyn Ness, aye. Thank you so much. And then we'll, we'll uh, we plan to come back to executive session, hopefully right about six o'clock. Um, That's regular session. Regular session, out of executive session and into regular session. So we will be back. Welcome back to the uh, Town of Deerfield Select Board Board of Health Sewer Commissioners meeting for January 11th, 2023. We've um, adjourned from executive session or back in open session at 6.05 p.m. So welcome everybody. Um, we have public comment first. Um, so anybody has anything they would like to address the board or anything on the agenda they wanted to talk about tonight? Um, happy to, hi, Deborah, how are you? Hi, happy new year. I'm well, and, uh, if it's okay, I'll start with public comment. Thank you. Okay. Um, Evening, Trevor, Tim, and Carolyn. I'm commenting on the Human Rights Ad Hoc Committee agenda item for tonight. Um, for the last six months, I and several members of the Deerfield Inclusion Group have been discussing the formation of a Human Rights Committee with the Select Board. What are the basic criteria which we all agreed on um, for forming a Human Rights Committee was establishing a safe and welcoming space where diverse members of the community would feel comfortable to serve and also approach 
a human rights um, committee with their concerns. Oftentimes, diverse community members are people who have been marginalized, underrepresented, and unfortunately, in our country, there's a long history of mistreatment, sometimes by government officials. And I'm bringing this up to underscore that having town employees, um, especially police, on the committee is counterproductive to what I and many people, and I think what we've been discussing, is the mission. There is a power differential. Police and town officials hold power in a way that others don't. It doesn't mean a human rights committee doesn't work or meet with police or any other town department. On the contrary, a human rights committee would work with anyone where there is a human rights issue. Um, and, you know, ideally the human rights ad hoc committee would have diverse members of the community who want to serve um, and would be independent and free to advise the select board. So respectively tonight, I, I'd like to ask you to reiterate the mission of the Human Rights Committee and also of this advisory ad hoc committee. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments tonight? Oh, Chris. Yeah. Oh, hey, Chris. Welcome. How's it going? Um, yeah, so very briefly, I'm just representing the Friends of Deerfield. Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank everybody in the town and the support that we got from the select board and a lot of volunteers for executing the Jubilee. I think it um, went quite well. We learned a few things that we could have done better, but uh, but I think the feedback has been fairly positive on social media, et cetera. It was lovely. It was lovely, Chris. So thank you. Um, secondly, uh, there's, we, uh, the steering committee met on Monday, uh, the 350th steering committee, and they decided to move the parade fireworks date to the 17th of June, which is a uh, one week later than we decided previously they decided, and that affords us a lot of opportunity for that weekend. And so one thing related to that was a concept, which is a concept at this point, it's, it's nothing's been done is if we could ever um, get certain businesses in the center of South Deerfield, restaurants and, and bars, if you will, um, uh, to uh, deploy tents and tables and chairs outside in a safe manner to accommodate more patrons. And maybe do that not just for one weekend, but for two or three weekends to July 4th or what have you. And so the question I would have to the select board and to the town administrator is, uh, is this the type of thing where the friends of Deerfield should first go to the businesses and determine the level of interest? And then do we come back to the town and figure out how to how to organize this? I, my opinion, Chris, is that um, if we would, the select board should allow the friends of Deerfield to approach businesses to see if there's any interest with them. And then um, come back to us for um, to see what we as the town can participate with you or to help you and facilitate something happening. Yeah, uh, permits, permits, road restrictions, parking restrictions, you know, this type of stuff. But the first step is to find out if they're up for it. Right. Yes. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. That Does makes that sense. Make sense. Yeah, be curious guys? to hear back. Yeah. yeah. Okay. For sure. Great idea. Okay, so we, I mean, I don't know if you have to have a motion somewhere along the line that we go off and do that, but that's what we're going to do now that we've heard this. Yeah, no, I think there's consensus. Just... Consensus is fine, Chris. Yep, hear, hear okay. back. On what thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Yep. And again, thank you, Chris, for all the work you did. I mean, it was just everyone, Stan Adams and Jennifer Remillard, it was just a lovely, lovely way to start um, the new year and then the and then the cake lighting happening the next day it was just really nice yep and Jim Cambius as well yes yep. absolutely yeah. great great job everyone totally here. welcome yep any other public comment this evening no seeing none maybe we'll move on to our regular business um 
So we don't have any scheduled hearings tonight. We have appearances at 630, which we can come back to for the Tilton Library trustees. Um, Trevor? Yes. Could I interrupt for just one second? Yeah. Uh, Chris just reminded me of something. Chris, and I mean Chris Harris, um, that weekend is Juneteenth weekend. And I just want to bring that to your attention. Hmm. Um, it. I don't know how the community is going to feel about that, but it's... Yeah. I just committee wanted you to know. Committee um, decided to, um, because it was a holiday weekend, we mm -hmm. wanted to celebrate it. Okay. Um, so let's see, any select board uh, reports, announcements? Anybody want to? I, I just to? wanted to, I mean, the only thing I was going to bring up was that we had the parade change, which um, Chris has brought up, which is June 17th now. Um, we're still working on the fireworks. Um, and I just want to thank the three, the Friends of Deerfield for really the Jubilee was lovely. It really, truly was a wonderful event. And I felt like it was really celebratory. I, I want to add my voice to that too. I think it was, um, it was a really special night. And it, it was amazing to see so many fresh faces that I, I, I don't know. And there was just a lot of people there that, um, I don't see all the time, and um, uh, it, it was just really well put together. Stan Adams and uh, Jennifer Remillard and and Jim Cambius and um, and Chris really did a great job, uh, and all the other volunteers. Um, you know, feel like I'm tooting the same horn, but it, it was just really special after two years or more of um, of COVID and being isolated and not being together, and all of that time. I have been looking forward to 2023. We're not past COVID by any stretch of the means, but um, we were at least aware enough and able to um, gain, you know, get together and, and celebrate, uh, you know, a, a momentous occasion like that. 350 years is um, is pretty special. It's, you know, 100, 100 years before um, this country even came into being. But what I found really interesting in my research of our history was um, was just looking at you know, how Deerfield came to be and, and learning about the indigenous people who lived here before and, and having um, Ms. Rainwater speak, uh, I guess was her name, I'm drawing a blank at the moment, but um, she it was from Coldwin a, Kaiser. Coldwin Kaiser, thank you. And, and, and um, you know, just ha how she spoke about, like, we haven't gone anywhere, we're here. Like, this is, you know, it's not like we're, you know, so I, I really am interested in working with her on the, um, and having her get involved, and she was really excited about uh, about getting involved in some of the program of the Human Rights Committee and what we could do about, you know, learning about our past and how to how to you know bridge those relationships and foster that relationship going forward. And uh, just super nice lady, and um, she's doing great work. So that was um, that was super nice, super great to see, and um, just a really good time. So um, let's see. I had uh, just a quick update on the sewer. But uh, Jonathan, John Posey from Current Steering Committee. Uh, so, just a quick question: uh, Has the uh, all the events been finalized for the June fifteenth? I don't uh, believe so. We have a draft calendar. Okay. Do you happen to know when that would be available? Um, you know what? I can have uh, Peter Thomas um, email you what we have so far. All okay. Right. And what, what day is the parade being changed to? June seventeenth. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Um, so getting back to my comment, I think the um, we had a, a uh, our monthly sewer committee uh, sewer uh, construction meeting at the plant, and um, I got a really good chance to tour the facility inside and out, crawl around it, and um, it you know again on target, pretty close to budget for what we're doing there. Um, it is pretty impressive just looking at the um, equipment, the pumps. RAS pumps, um, WAS pumps, all these new terminologies, but um, the uh, clarifiers is all the, all the mechanisms are going into that. It's getting backfilled. The you know the weirs are going in, and just a lot of the launder walls are done, and they're starting to work on the um, aeration tank, the, that secondary one that hadn't been in use. So that concrete should be happening fairly soon. Um, just looking amazing. 
Yeah, it's just really fun to see that project coming together. The Headworks building is just about done. We are behind and will be behind on completion because of electrical. We're just, it's like 18 months out and we planned for maybe six months out. So it's been rough, but they keeping on it and trying to get it done. And what's nice is that we did do that secondary change order so they can continue to work and we're not like shutting down, waiting for anything. They can continue to work and then they'll, they'll be back to do all the electrical when it's done. So um that's wonderful yeah it's looking good um is that it yeah, yeah so i've got sure. a couple of things i'd like to report um we uh heard back from the department of energy about our geothermal application with some requests for uh additional information we filed um the response today the overall impression was that uh, the application was looked on favorably uh, there were a couple of uh, questions about um, <clears throat> we as a, a pretty homogenous uh, community um, don't fall under a lot of uh, social justice, environmental justice, and other categories. But um, you know, we were able to respond to those things, uh, pointing out that we have, uh, as many rural communities in Massachusetts have uh, a, a growing population of. Um, elder citizens, regardless of ethnicity or other considerations, who are living on fixed income. And that's uh, the largest component of our population for age groups is the 55 to 75 and up at, at almost uh, 31%. So um, that was a great thing to have done. And, and hopefully we'll get a positive response because this would be a great um, addition to the campus project. and. Um, how much is that grant? We the, the, we're, we're in the first phase. We're implying for three hundred seventy-two thousand dollars, which would be for engineering for uh, a geothermal field that could encompass the library, this building, the eighteen eighty-eight building, and the um, eighteen twenty-one church building, and um, any senior housing that we could site in this campus area. Um, so, uh, particularly now that the libra library projects expansion has been approved this is this will be a great addition to us and help us manage energy costs in the new building mm. so uh, that's that's the big news uh, right and um will we have an opportunity to talk about mvp later uh, we had a sure. meeting this morning yeah. so yeah I'll, we can't i mean you yeah. well we could do it right now because yeah. we have a couple minutes before yeah, go ahead. okay yeah let me do that 6 30. so the mvp uh group met again this morning to talk about uh there's a deadline to for a letter of interest to the state is January 20th. And we identified five projects that we've talked about before. Uh, one of them is, uh, you know, the green infrastructure portions of the Leary lot, um, the green infrastructure portions of the uh, elementary school entryway, mm -hmm. um, a healthy soils, the healthy soil strategy, um, uh, implement, implementation strategy uh, discussion that would involve, um, Carolyn might be able to speak to this better, uh, and then some projects that we uh, had worked on in the past, in past MVP, um, the MVP4 grant. Uh, this will be a follow-on to, to do um, installation of uh, rain gardens and uh, tree box filters in historic Deerfield. And then um, I brought the MVP group up to speed on the fact that we're going to meet with Mass Dot about the town common area, but one thing that they uh, that it was felt that would be worth looking into is um, doing some more coordination of the green streets, complete streets, mm -hmm. you know, bearing in mind that you will come back with new information, Trevor, from Mass yeah. Dot. Um, so. I would like to uh, have us consider uh, approving uh, having Chris Curtis write a letter of interest and um, submit it uh, with Casey's uh, assistance, or, or actually, I think Chris Nolan is now working with the MVP group. So, mm -hmm. um, so that we can meet the January 20 deadline uh, to see what kinds of money we can get for the 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 green infrastructure components of these big projects that we have coming up. Um, I would I would support that. We already know we're going to do the Leary lot. We already know we're going to do the entryway 
to the um, elementary school, I would also want to include the flood resiliency to the old Deerfield wastewater treatment plant because we know eventually we're going to be doing something, but it doesn't necessarily have to be in this round, but I think we need to throw it into the letter just in case, you know, there's any possibility we can get support for that. But um, I, here's a list I of things. Do you have a, okay, is this yeah. a spare or something? Yeah, like yeah I think oh, okay. you, you can have this one. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so. Right. So um, the ones that are circled are the ones that you're yeah, looking at moving forward with. And Chris Curtis and, and the rest of us, our opinion was that we should pick five elements that we know are focused on. And then he would put in a couple of optional things. One was, um, I think, a feasibility study about the microgrid uh, for the town campus and also mm -hmm. this uh, resiliency project for the, the, the sewer. Okay. Uh, because... He's not sure we're, we're trying to gauge the response from MVP for these kinds of big, sure. bigger infrastructure yeah. problem program uh, projects that are not necessarily, you know, mm -hmm. based on who uh, is the new EEO um, secretary, Chief Hoffer, she is has a wonderful background and is very supportive of all this climate change stuff, but but the administration themselves are really focused on energy. Mm -hmm. So I think the combination is going to go to our benefit. It, right. The way Chris is going to write this letter and would support, but I mean, I, I it, it was not going to hurt one way or the other. This right. is just yeah, letter it's a letter of interest. Intent. Yeah, right. right. Exactly. And the, and the actual, you know, the actual writing and stuff will, would come back to um, the select board. I, I actually encourage them to, consider bringing something back either two weeks from now or at the, at the latest four weeks from now. That's, 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 you know, okay, mm -hmm. this is what we're really going to do. And okay. So, right. um, this and since we're not going to have a select board meeting be before the 20th, that's why I wanted to get approval tonight to approve writing a letter and having him coordinate with town administrator and one of us, if we can designate whomever, mm -hmm. Carolyn, you know, myself, Fine, um, either way. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Do, do you want to make a motion? Yeah, I'll make that motion. Okay. okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor? I'll so, second it. Oh, yeah, second. Sorry. Yeah. And, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll I, in favor. In I, 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 Trevor McDaniel. I, Carolyn Ness. Okay. Thank you very much. I um, think there's going to be more money in this MVP program. So that's why I think it's worth it based on this. And the, and the last item, uh, just before we get uh, into the other part of the meeting, um, so we received a grant. Um, we applied for a grant from uh, the DEP for um, the wastewater treatment project um, for energy efficiency with the aerator, uh, the, the aerators that we're doing and the changing that we're doing there. And we have been um, approved. So it says, congratulations. I'm pleased to notify you that Deerfield Water Utility has been awarded a uh, GAP-3 grant for municipal drinking water and or wastewater facilities in the amount of $179,173 through MassDEP's Clean Energy Results Program, SERP, uh, with the support of the Department of Energy Resources, DOER. Uh, your grant award may be further adjusted based on the availability of util utility incentives. Um, so I wanted to thank you and uh, thank you for your commitment to installing energy efficiency and or renewable energy measures at your facility uh, that will reduce energy use and costs and emissions of greenhouse gases uh, to the benefit of all, of all of our communities and the environment. So that's really exciting news. I just want to let everybody know that. Mm. Yeah, definitely great news. Yeah. Um. Yep. And I want to thank DEP. Uh, 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 Day Prickett Engineering because th they helped write the grant and, and on our behalf and move forward on this with all the work they're doing at the plant. They kind of knew what we were needing and what was going yeah. in, so they did a lot of work on that and follow up stuff. So very very happy to have that. Um, so one final note on MVP: please? there is a new um, with the new administration and the new year. There's a new program called Piloting MVP 2.0. Which is um, which will allow the town to apply for funding to do MVP planning and to ex expand the core group in our MVP um, committee, 
to you know get more buy-in from different aspects of the, the community so that's not anything we need to deal with tonight but um i'm going to ask you know chris curtis to come and speak to the select board about what this means okay in a future meeting great sounds good and and uh thursday is the um state commission meeting on soil um water and related resources and so we will be discussing what the state's action plan that was released in january 4th is going to look like and how it's going to be implemented and then we'll have more of a uh, knowing what we on the local level here are going to do the idea is to figure out what the state's going to do so we can apply for some funding to do projects here in town sounds good that will help with our water table and then just so everybody is aware we're uh going to mma to boston finally again after three years or more uh so we'll be going to uh boston for the mma uh, uh convention which would be um i think the 19th 18th or 19th or 20th or something like that 20th next, and 21st 19th. yeah thank you <laughs> the end of next week <laughs> so uh really excited to kind of uh, find out what's going on in boston and meet with our colleagues across the state and the region here and we've got some separate meetings uh for western mass um uh select board members and uh just trying I, to get rolling again. you know what I, that reminds me we have the meeting tomorrow to discuss some yes, of you do. Pri yep. priorities yep but i was also asked to be on maya's advisory board oh great and i um thought i'd let you know yeah that i perfect. accepted the position that'd be great that sounds good so we'll have the hot skinny on how to yeah. save money yeah that's perfect <laughs> you know right where we need to be yeah. so good deal okay good, good um let's see so i guess we're, we're at 6 30 now so we can transition to the um we have a, appearances with a uh, tilton library trustees for a recommendation for establishment of a building committee discussion on ideas and timeline for temporary library location during construction so welcome how are you good have a seat and we'll do we talk about yeah, yeah please please come on up yep we'll pull up a chair or no, anybody? Oh, okay. Yeah, that's yeah, fine. Come on up. You. All of you are. <laughs> yeah. You can rotate. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's fine. Fine. Uh, <laughs> great. <laughs> well, welcome. Well, Happy New Year. Happy New Thank Year. You. Good to see you. To you. <sighs> so, um, do, does, uh, anybody want to run with this? I know we have a couple of memos here um, about putting together. Um, Maybe I'll just read them for the public. At least the first one here is the memo um, to the Deerfield Select Board. This is from the Tilton Library, from Candace um, Bradbury Carlin, Library Director, and the, um, the trustees recommended makeup of a building committee. So the following makeup of the Tilton Library Building Committee was suggested by the owner's project manager, OPM, and recommended by the Library Board of Trustees. The trustees are asking the select board to approve this format and to decide if they will do the official appointing of the members or leave that to the trustees. The OPM and the architect would like the building committee to start meeting as soon as possible with the goal of first uh, meeting taking place late January. Initially, the building committee will meet every two weeks for two hours to help the architect to complete the building design, including public forums. And once that stage is complete, the committee would meet once a month through construction. Um, so the, their request was one select board me member chosen by the select board, one finance committee member chosen by the finance committee, one trustee, uh, uh, Satu Zoller, already on the committee from the beginning, one friend of the library, is that right? Mm -hmm. um, which is Judy Holmes, uh, who's already been on the committee from the beginning. Uh, two community uh, members, so Eva Tor is an engineer, and Vern Harrington is the owner of Thayer Street Associates, uh, pending commitment. And then Candace uh, is the director ex officio. Um, do, do you have any, does this board have any comments on that, or do you want to? I, I think I mean, we uh, can... Tim has sort of volunteered. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm more than happy to be the select board member, and uh, I haven't asked, but I would certainly welcome Julie Chalfon's participation as the chair of the finance committee. Mm -hmm. um, so well, I'll make that motion to appoint uh, Tim Hilchey to be 
um, the select board representative. And I will Dr. second Rose that Clark. quickly. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Any further mind. discussion on this topic? Um, all those in favor? Tim Hilchey, aye. Trevor McDaniel, aye. Carolyn Ness, aye. And then, yeah, we can encourage uh, Julie, if she has time, to, to be on that committee. It would be great. And then a um, couple of questions for you just to understanding that Julie was going to bring that to their finance, next committee. finance meeting oh, good. and then make a determination. That's um, perfect. About that. So. Yeah, that sounds good. Can you talk us? I, I'm not familiar with either Eva Tor or Vern Harrington. Can you just um, briefly? Yeah, they're they're community members and they've been, you know, um, library patrons slash, you know, um, supporters. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's really important in this building committee to have people that have some knowledge of something to do with building mm -hmm. right. and or design. Yeah. And um, Eva is an engineer. And Vern is, uh, has worked in the building industry uh, as owner of the Thayer Street Associates. Um, and they were both, both very interested, okay. because, you know, I'm sure you know that it's Sometimes you don't have a, a, a huge pool of people that are willing to commit Definitely. to um, uh, regular meetings like that. Right. And um, when when these two people stepped up, we were very excited. Personally, I could vouch for both. I know Eva from my days with Caleb at, at school. Oh, yeah. We had kids similar <laughs> age. And I believe she works at DEP, if I'm... I think so. I, I'm pretty sure. And yeah. um, just a wonderful person, super knowledgeable. So no problem. Um, and Vern is it's fantastic and has built a lot That's of stuff over the years and just, really has yeah, an amazing yeah. pedigree of helping this project. So sure, comfortable with and, both. Yeah, I know the other uh, folks involved. Um, and uh, so I'm looking forward to helping out any Great. way I can. Yeah, so are we. Great. Great. That's wonderful. Thank so you. do we need to appoint those two or would the trustees appoint the, those two members? And the, well, I guess the the... The trustee would be from the trustees. That would well, I would. Or do we I, to I think it's just. I think we should just vote. That way, at least you have our approval, and we can right, ask the other trustee. Because we are sort of like the managers of the. Sounds good. So I think it's probably better. So, so I'll make a motion to um, appoint who is listed here: Satu, Judy, e Ava, and um, I mean Eva and uh, Vern. Okay. And Tim. And which Candace. we had already done, and Candace. So. Um, I'll second that motion. Yeah. Any further discussion, questions? Uh, Julie Shalfont is uh, has stepped up to be the interim person in case we do end up meeting as a building committee before they choose okay. that person. Then Got I, it. That's then great. I would add so Shalfont as the finance um, committee representative um, temporarily. Pen, yeah, pending their approval. Yeah. And that yeah. could end up being, you know, permanent. Yeah. Permanent. <laughs> Perfect. We're good with that. Very good with that. <laughs> So, so I'll um, second that uh, motion as amended. All right. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Tim Hilchey, aye. Trevor McDaniel, aye. Carolyn Ness, aye. Um, I did you. have a question. Um, we're going to the MMA conference, and we're going to try to reach out to the other communities while mm -hmm. we're there. Um, where are you on um, campaigning with the other libraries for your funding with um, Senator Tarr's bill? Well, um, Tim had the uh, benefit of being a part of our, our first meeting of the um, new year um, two days ago. Uh, we took a pause in December, um, but it seems as though we're going to be writing, well, we're going to be modeling a letter after um, the Gloucester Library that already wrote a letter, I think it's from their select board, and then they just, they had 400 people sign it um, within town offices in the community, and that was sent to I think, actually, I don't remember who it was sent to exactly. Um, do you remember that, Tim, who that letter was sent I, to? You? I believe it um, went to TAR and, you know, the leadership of the House and Senate. Um, okay. Yeah. That's our, obviously, that's what we'd want to do if we had similar. Letters. Right. So so what Tim tasked us, the, the those of us who were, pre who were present at the meeting, um, to do is to, um, you know, work on a similar letter with similar language and get signature as many signatures as we could get, you know, in the next week or two, so that that could also be sent to, um, to Senator Tarr and the, the other folks that um, the Glasser letter went to, so that when they come start budget talks in February, they'll have it right away. Okay, because yep. what, what we want to, we want to be able to, the IRA money, the Inflation Reduction Act money is coming down, so We've already missed the ARPA money, so that 
there's nothing we can do about that. But we want to make sure we're in line for the IRA money if if possible. Mm -hmm. And then, then there's also the pothole money, which will be available in May, April and May timeframe. Mm -hmm. That's all the little extra money from every agency that's left over that they can't spend in the next 60 days. That is literally, you know, pooled. Mm -hmm. And it's called the pothole money because that fills in a lot of, you know, these earmarks kind right. of thing. So we want to make sure that our requests are in in the beginning of February. Mm -hmm. So we're in line for the pothole money and whatever, however they decide how to spend the IRA money, that, you know, that would be some new, you know, different, not uh, normally line item money that, that we should right. be able to access. Right, right. So it's it's real serious that we get movement within the next two or three weeks. And I think that, um, Senator Tarr is still working with all the, the same legislators that were on board, you know, last year and with the Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners. And, um, and I know that the, the goal is to have a lot of these people meet at the MMA conference in, uh, next week. Um, so I think that I get the feeling that especially Senator Tarr, but the other legislators as well are, are really, really pushing this. Okay. So, yeah. well, and as yeah. far as the MMA goes, uh, what I asked the library folks, uh, this was the the eleven other library heads, is to you know gather a list of in their town of people who are going to be attending the MMA conference, so that we can try even if it's an impromptu, send an email before the conference saying, hey, would you be willing to spend you know thirty minutes over coffee to talk about how we move, uh, you know, how we advocate yeah, for this, yeah. <laughs> Um, as a, you know, in a positive way to keep um, keep Senator Tarr's interest at a fever pitch. Well, and we and we want to make sure that the percentage of money that he's requesting is close to the hundred percent. You right. know, there's right. a huge difference between four hundred thousand and four million. Yes, <laughs> for our, our project. So. You know, we want to make sure it's all to our advantage to make sure we're asking for a hundred percent. Sure, the yeah. difference. And yep. you know, or if we get some reduced amount in the potholes, that the when we get to the IRA phase, we get the other percentage. You know, so it's a strategy session, getting everyone in the same right. place and right. coming up with, you know, saying okay, you like that idea, so you're going to do that, right? And uh, pigeonhole people into doing what they should do so well a couple of things um you know we're going to keep the the 12 libraries um and i think westboro will still be going after it because it doesn't matter the, we find out from the mblc it doesn't matter if um their if their town voted no if they were a part of this original push um if their town will accept the money and will use it for the, for their libraries that they can still be a part of you know of that um we're going to be meeting weekly on Tuesdays and when Tim's available, you know, he's welcome to join us and Sharon Sherry, the director of the Amherst Jones library. She's very active about this and she meets if not weekly, then bi-weekly with um, Joe Comerford and Mindy Dom and they have the ear of Jim McGovern. Um, so I think we're just going to keep going and just keep, keep pushing. Plugging away. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's really, it's really important. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the next item is is uh, looking for temporary space. So the the next memo I'll just read for the public is uh, this is um, again looking at uh, library temporary space during construction. The following are ideas for places in which the library can operate store uh, and store materials during construction of the of the renovation of the expansion of the library. The uh, trustees would like to know if the town has space. <laughs> <laughs> we have done, um, has space that would be appropriate uh, for their operations as well as um, as space for storage of books and other materials. If no if no such space uh, currently exists, the trustees want to know if um, the town would cover the rent of of a space not owned by the town. Another idea is to check with the local private schools and uh, and office buildings. Perhaps the space would be donated uh, for the time the library is there. Requirements from the Massachusetts Board of uh, Library Commissioners is uh, for the space is that heating and cooling, plumbing, restroom accessible, and enough space for staff and patrons to fit comfortably 
Um, a lot of the books, DVDs, audiobooks, and et cetera, will go into storage, and only the most popular and bestseller items, along with a good size of the children's collection, will be in the operations space. So a few ideas they had were townhome spaces, um, the old Cumberland Farms building, uh, PVMA, and he owned empty buildings, uh, historic Deerfield, same thing, any buildings not being used, Deerfield Academy, maybe temporary classroom, mobile structures, Eagle Brook. Uh, school, um, Treehouse Brewing, which is interesting. Um, the old Volvo dealership, I'm not sure how much is being used there. Um, and then uh, buildings across from Red Roof Inn, the gas station, Snowco, you know, the donut, well, donut, you know, that area. Yeah, but, but they never can get anything done. So yeah, <laughs> it's been true. empty for years. <laughs> um, so my, um, my thought was um, an RFP should go out for request for proposals of space. Um, we would write an RFP, uh, somebody maybe for a to help or something. Get get an get an RFP out. What's available? These are our needs. Um, these are our requirements. And what does everybody have? And what what would the rate be to do that? Um, the treehouse is interesting too because there is. Um, I know there's a lot of space there. They did open up mm. second floor, which is exciting. So for for <laughs> um, events, uh, they have space upstairs now. But I do know that there was a lot of office space on that first floor that probably isn't being used yet. And maybe they're interested. I mean, they were so generous with the um, the COVID clinics that they might be interested in mm. another uh, uh, goodwill thing as well, um, or maybe for, for a stipend or something. I, I, like I would like us to write an official letter to Cumberland Farms. I mean, mm -hmm. this face of that building is so ugly. Yeah. It's, right, <laughs> it's a mess. Right in the center of town. And yep. if we could get that donated or at a really cheap rate, I would right. really, it would be to the town's benefit. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, there's a few good items to work on here. We need to mm -hmm. get that going. One question I have is, do you have um, good figures for, like, how much space you're going to need for storage and how much space, uh, how, how much of your collection and what's what space you need for the active component of the library? Because we can't put an RFP out if, unless we know what we need. I guess we'll have to work with um, Dan Pallotta, um as well as MBLC to help us figure, you know, um, do some calculations. Because um, in my mind, it was like, well, what space is available? And then that would inform us what we could take with us. But I think it'd be also good to do the opposite of what you're, you know, what you're suggesting, mm -hmm. like how much space do we need? Um, and if there's more space, great. And if it's, if it's just enough, fine. Um, so I guess I'll have to talk to the, the people that, that are, you know, guiding us about that. And that might be actually the work, the, the beginning work of the building committee when they first get together to mm -hmm. start yeah. to work on something concrete. Yeah, I know that the, if I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but MBLC requires you to have something like 10% or 5% of, of the component no nope. there there's no no the only requirements are the ones listed here okay so yeah they're very non-specific too then about yes. how much you need to have yes. in it but okay but yeah. you want to have enough that people come and use it yeah yep um and, and a couple other things that i found out after this oh, memo please. um is that there is a little room in the budget um to go you know in the grant budget to go towards um you know uh if we had to pay rent and or okay. pay for storage it wouldn't cover all of it but it would cover some of it Good. um and then lauren from the mblc did say that if there was absolutely if we tried really hard there's absolutely nothing in deerfield that we could um we don't have to stay in deerfield we go to a neighboring town right she said that you know patrons probably wouldn't be pleased but it's not against the rules okay so yeah so um maybe hit you know what i guess when you the first meeting or so if, if you're taking this item up but um would be to hit on those few low-hanging fruits like treehouse and the cumberland farms but then maybe quickly move to that rfp so that we can get an answer pretty quick on does anybody else have anything out there yeah um okay Anything else we could do? Um, who would be a point person in town offices to work with us on that? If, you're, if there's an RFP, would that be the select board or? Generally, it would be Casey's office, but I'm not going to promise that she's, <laughs> she's so busy. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I would think usually it would be the, the library would trustees would go out and do an RFP for that unless okay. it's um, 
you know, and, and we could try and see if I, when we've done a few things or like the school has done a uh, request or proposal, they, they sometimes hire the PROCOG and they, they do it. Uh -huh. Okay. So I know Casey that... might have some hints on that. What do you think, Casey? Am I on the right? Yeah, I think you're along the right track and RFP for that kind of space would be useful if we can't find donated space. Right. Um, but the RFP process is pretty complex. So Candace, I would say a good place to start. I can't guarantee that I have the bandwidth for it, but a good right. place to start if I don't is Andrea Woods up at the Franklin Regional Council of Governments yeah. in the procurement office. She's their chief procurement officer and she's I can give you her contact information. Yeah, actually, we deal with her um, because we have a uh, with other libraries, we have a contract because of our lift. Oh, yeah. You know, lift oh, yeah. You do have the lift contract. So, yeah, yeah. Andrea. Yeah, she's and very also, nice. Also, Dan Pilata wrote an RFP for us uh, for the 1888 building when we were. So, yeah, he's probably capable of doing this as well. So, sure. We speak to him. Yep. Yeah, I imagine that when we have our first meeting with the building committee, a lot of these questions will be answered. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Okay. Dan will have suggestions. Yes. yes. Sounds good. Well, wonderful. I think we're done. I think that's it. Anything else? No? Nope. Good Good times ahead. Thank you. <laughs> off we go. Yes, <laughs> off you go. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Yep. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Um, any Board of Health uh, items you want? I know we have, we're going to talk about Board of Health agent hours um yeah but i just want i just want to say we haven't had any wastewater treatment um sampling for over a month which has something been with a test right and i think you fixed that uh, we found them or something they no, they were sending me the test oh they are okay Eric, Eric. It just disappeared okay that's weird well with everything going on there i can imagine why it's mean, just a lot happening at that place eric so. never told us he just didn't find him yeah maybe he thought it was over yeah well whatever yeah anyway um the new variants uh are very concerning they could um trigger a new wave uh wave and that's why we're really concerned the wastewater numbers are way up in the other communities and so we're kind of going by the spike in hospitalizations and stuff like that. Um, it's uh, the sequencing that's being done in the region is 52% is this new XBB, about 20% is the BQ 1.1, and 17% is the BQ Q1, which is roughly about 90% of um, the cases, and they're pro proven to be immune evasive including outdoors, you you can be exposed outdoors, which is new. And prior to this, we've been, you know, concerned about um, the BA5 and the BA4, and that's less than four or 5% of, of what's happening now. Yeah. So we've definitely moved on. Um, the most important thing is to be up to date. And that means boosters, um, the Omicron, um, bivalent it seems to be working so you will get less severity of symptoms um just try to minimize your risk as much as possible you go into public spaces like stores just just wear a mask again right now that's more, more you know, and more that people, kind of thing more and more people are getting it i mean i'm here you know people who have not have been able to dodge it for three years I'm one of them. Um, have, haven't gotten it, but uh, yeah, knock on some wood somewhere. But uh, I'm sure my number's coming up pretty quick. But I mean, people who just have literally been able we to dodge it are now getting yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, it seems I, like I haven't gotten it either. And I, you know, just I wear masks when I go into stores and stuff. And like again, that. generally, the consensus, and this is anecdotal from just the people I, I talk to, if you're healthy, if you're boosted, current boosted, you know, it's, it's you know, it's a flu. You're not, you're not, um, you're not winding up in the hospital, but if you are immune compromised, you can. So or I have underlying conditions. Underlying conditions. You might not even know that you have underlying conditions. Mm -hmm. That's what's so scary. So, yeah. and then this Do consistently twenty percent of the cases have long haul COVID. And are we? See Do we have? So my question in talking with someone the other day about this was, um, what is the data? You know, last year we had tons of data. Right, state's not doing data. We're not doing the testing anymore. All we have is wastewater data. 
So my question is, is, are the hospitals still reporting out to anybody how many people they have in there? What's the well, that's severity? what we're by the hospitalizations. There was a, there's a, yeah. was a spike, you know, last week. It's, you know, up to 10 people were hospitalized um, from our little co-op uh, group. Mm -hmm. From your group. Okay. Yeah, from Sunderland, um, Deerfield, Greenfield, and Montague. Montague. Okay. And, you know, we've, you know, there's been deaths. There's been deaths, four, five, you know, seven deaths. Mm -hmm. I think last week was nine deaths. Yeah. I mean, that's, to me, that's terrible. Yeah. I mean, I. Well, you, you look at what's happening in China. They only had 17, right? 17 deaths so far, right? That's what they said. And their <laughs> their morgues are completely over full. Like they, they cannot, there's, I think they said, not, was there 94 million people are infected at the moment? So it, it it's, and that's a place where they apparently have it under control. Mm. And they're opening it up and they're traveling everywhere now. So um, we're in for another ride, it sounds like I know. to me. So. But I so, think what's more scary about this new variants is that there is evidence now that these new variants, you can get reinfected within 10 months. days, right. which is unbelievable. It I mean, is. You, at least you felt you had some immunity. If you, if you did get COVID, mm -hmm. well, I'm yeah. off the hook for sure. maybe a month or two or three, whatever. But there no. are so many more variants just emerging. Yes, that's, that's what's... the biggest problem is the fact that it's having the multiplier effect. So and these and these variants come in and within a week or two, they push out the other variants. Mm -hmm. This is the the turnover is very fast. You just don't we just never have seen that before. Right. Yeah. But we people just don't understand when you follow this stuff, it's just it's mind blowing. Uh, what is happening and 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 it is being tracked but the fact is you can you can have a variant in town this week and in in another week or two it's another whole variant and so the, and these new ones you can get infected within 10 days even and vaccinated it, yeah mm -hmm. even vaccinated and so i think that we have about we ha are extremely well vaccinated we have yeah. over a 95 percent mm -hmm. vaccination rate i'm not sure accurately what if that's 100% because it's based on zip code, and then you know. Right, and about 86 are boosted, at least had the, the 86% right. are boosted. Mm -hmm. So we have extremely high numbers, but people just need to know they just need to be careful and try to minimize the risk as much as possible for the rest of the winter because you still flu out there. Mm -hmm. Flu is and the RSV. RSV. And our, there's a couple of respiratory things that are floating around too, but the the flu is this flu year is probably the worst since 2009. The flu shot is a good match. This year, it's an excellent match to what is circulating. So you get a shot, you don't have full immunity for up to 10, you know, around 10 days, but there's still a lot of winter left. So mm -hmm. if you haven't gotten a flu shot, you didn't come to one of our clinics, you better go out and get your flu shot because yeah. it's nasty to have one of this yeah. flu. People have been miserably sick. Yeah, um, it's been so a bad nationally. Um, the 14 day rolling average of new COVID daily cases is 64,000, and mm -hmm. deaths is 580 a day. So, wow. you know, 5,800 people are dying every 10 days in this 14 day moving average, right? So it's definitely still with us. And with the with the variants that are changing all the time, it's like a Russian roulette. You don't really know when that one variant is going to be the one that is extremely deadly. Like, I mean, because that's what viruses do. They just keep on right. keeping we, on. We are so trying we... to keep up with the sequencing. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, DPH is doing the sequencing so that we kind of know what's happening in town as far as what kind of variants we have, but yeah. it's scary in the fact that the turnover is so fast. Yeah, and and here we were. Just if you look at our minutes, watch out for the BA four. Watch out for the BA five. That yeah. was just yeah. a little and while ago, and now we're. It's a whole new range of variants, and that and that's what really people have to be aware of. Mm -hmm. This is constantly evolving, and it is constantly in the background for us. And so you just have to take a few precautions. Wear a mask. If and if you do have symptoms, we have COVID tests right here yeah, in the lobby. We have COVID tests you right know, here. We'll, they work well. We've had over 5,000 COVID tests, you know, distributed from the state. Good. Um, so we're... We're trying to make them be available and yeah. whatever.
so that it's not to be totally depressing because you know people <laughs> you know we have a couple clusters in town and you know people know that they they were exposed so i think really what is really important is that people just try to pay attention still be still be vigilant it's really worth it um well we're going to talk a little bit about um board of health agent hours but i was i know i have budgets here casey do i have a board of health budget we haven't really um talked about it yet so I don't, we yeah. don't have a template yet to work but on. I might've forgotten to get that one to you. I'll have to look. Okay. Well, the reason, Trevor, I'm sorry. The okay. reason why I wanted to bring up the board of health hours is because Alex is out of school and um, he has left his Southwick job. So when the last that we had really talked about hours, he was working about 10 hours a week or so. And, um, you know, cause he was going to school, he had a full-time job, but he now is more available. And um, so I'm hoping that he'll work um, all day Monday, all day Wednesday, and then have um, uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday float for, you know, so we're around 20 to 25 hours, um, if, if, you know, depending on what is happening. Does that make sense to, to you both? So basically, just go back to how it was. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, I we I, we had originally budgeted this time this last year. We had originally budgeted for thirty hours because week, yeah. we thought we were going to um, have stream activity from Treehouse. You know, every right. weekend was going to be crazy, and that just hasn't panned out. So right, um, there's still every Friday night through the winter here you know, there's going to be food trucks at mm -hmm. Deerfield Academy. So right. Alex, he's going to have some hours devoted on Friday evening doing those mm -hmm. inspections because we already know that's going to happen. The weekend ones through the winter, I mean, I don't know, Alex, do we have any idea from the permits in the next few weeks? It's really, there's no treehouse permits really, are there? Uh, no, there's hardly any um, not uh, mobile food unit operations at this for the time. rest yeah. for the winter they, so. they mostly close down because no one's out on the yeah, mountain, cold. you know um so but so, the activities in restaurants has increased though yeah. right and that's a good thing to be oh yeah. following up yeah. and making so, sure so alex this month alex is we um it's mandatory to do all the school restaurants twice a year so yeah. we traditionally do january um and then in august september before the schools go back yeah. for those you know, those two mm -hmm. rotations. Then um, I was going to have Alex do the rest of the restaurant inspections because we always, you know, when there's no septic, no perk tests, no, um, you know, tie to fives, this is the time That's to do, time. go through the entire yep. restaurant list. Any problem ones that we have, you just do follow-ups, whether it's real serious, you do it within a couple of weeks. If it's, you're just looking for compliance and you do it like within a month, but you do the reinspections of anything that came up. Mm -hmm. And then what happens is we usually do a second round through the rest of the end of the year um, as you have time, you know, um, for anybody that didn't have problems. So we do do our restaurants twice a year. It's just more random on the second round. Which is good to be random. Yeah. It's, but they do occur in January because that's usually quiet with no other septic stuff. So, um, so are, do we have another, uh, like a, another hiring letter or something that's going to state these hours? So we have this document. Yeah, it's posted on the doors and on the website and everything. Like okay. That, so, yeah. but I mean, like, an, is there an employment letter? Casey, is there something we have to, uh, it might be a good, to, a good idea to up, update the employment letter. Okay. Okay. We, I don't think we ever changed it when we went to the 10 hour. Right. No. Well, we should do that when we, yeah. every okay. time we make so, a change. All right. I can update that. All right. So let me just be clear. It's 25 hours a week, 20 to 25 hours a week. Yeah. I, the only reason I say. It, you never know what he's going to be. Yeah, doing it depends. Time. So, I mean, I would say average 20 hours a week, but the possibility of going up to 25. Okay. 
Well, don't forget we have like vaccination clinics right. or we have stuff that come up, you know. So that's why I don't want to, I don't want to say 20 hours a week because. You know, well, the not- current letter of employment I have is uh, to go ahead and, and as a benefit employee, um, part time is to um, work on average minimum um, 20 hours a week. So. Oh, is it? I thought yeah, it, was, it can't uh, be. It's got to be 30 to get better. Got to be 30. Yeah, we wrote 30, Alex. Oh. I looked at the letter a couple days ago. Because okay. you can't do benefits in under 30, correct? No, under t- uh, you actually benefits are required over 20. But oh. his offer letter actually right now, the existing one says 30 hours a week. Which one is that, Casey? That's the um, I'll go back and give you the. That was the original hire. That was the original for your full-time hire. Well, do we, I mean, do we want to sort this out over the next week, have a letter, and then uh, on our next meeting, have a budget sheet to look at what that does? Oh, yeah, we'll have the budget by then. Yeah, I, yeah think- I, can, uh, I can do the letter and send it out, and I'll look in my email. I'm pretty sure I have it. I just need to look. I, and then the, just really- the only reason the budget, we haven't really looked at the budget is because... Um, I'm not sure how our public health excellent grants, we have two public health excellent grants right. that um, I go to meetings every month to participate, you know, check off the boxes. Um, they're $300,000, just about $300,000 for the public health collaborative. For, we, for everybody, right. Yeah, we get a portion of that. Right, the four of us, the four little towns. And then there's almost another, I think it's like 296,000 for um, additional, um uh nursing and mm-hmm. i mean it doesn't cover anything of alex's you know baseline salary right. but we get additional um you know and ins- health inspector um nursing uh i don't know different things and so i'm not sure how that's going to impact <laughs> our overall budget we should nail that down yes we need to nail it down so, so maybe just revisit this next meeting and yes yeah i haven't budget. even seen any of the information because well, the so. contracts were just yeah. we were just signing off at the end of the year mm-hmm. uh in december um greenfield was just they're the fiduciary um, right they're the fiduciary they were just going through the contracts um the nursing one is already in effect right that's the one that we hire the epidemiology that we get all the information from and the seat you know that we meet every friday and then this other public health grant we just signed the contract we've done the preliminary assessment work and um it should start this month um or next month depending on the hiring schedule but um and that that's a 10-year grant the Epi grant was seven year grant. So it's 300,000 every year for seven years and almost 300,000 every year for 10 years. So it has huge impact for us. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I'm just not sure how that Alex and I have to go through our budget to figure out how that's gonna, like, what can we cut back on that? You can, you, you have your baseline budget, but then what, what like supplies and Mm -hmm. Education. what the benefits we can get yeah from. so maybe a right. meeting with the group to then right. tell us so what we'll we're getting out of it or i need more information to come right to so we could do that by next meeting or whatever and i think yeah. we're still yeah. waiting for the state for that right pardon me we're still waiting for the state for that well no, we signed off the contract but i just i'm not sure how, how it's not clear in my mind based on what we have in our budget what is actually you know what what is going to keep us from spending that money in the Mm-hmm. next budget year right so, okay i i don't know i'll have the answer in a couple of weeks okay we have two more meetings um you know coming up and and that should sort it out i hope okay that's good anything else you want to hit on alex while we're here uh, i just wanted to um well um just want to mention with the nature grant that we got for the workforce capacity and you know preparedness uh, technical assistance um that was a really good grant, uh, really uh, fantastic, uh, fantastic. So I'm just finishing up on um, some of the reporting and whatnot, but um, there was uh, a potential for um, other funding opportunities that um, uh, that the town is able to apply to, if that's something that the board is interested in, that we can also think about when it comes to budget season as well. Um, 
and then housing code uh, changes and updates. So I'm, I'm planning on going to a meeting uh, the end of or um, <clears throat> February 1st to um, go over that. And um, yeah, right now, uh, just focusing on um, making sure that we get, because um, right now, as you know, like uh, last time we did the cut of five was December 1st. And um, so right now doing the food and dealing with um, housing and whatnot. So, okay. Yeah. Other than that, things are going well, dropping off some COVID tests and masks for the schools. Mm -hmm going to do the inspections at the schools um, mm -hmm. this week and next week. So, okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Trevor. Uh, yep. Casey. Could I interrupt for just a second? Please? I just want to remind everybody that um, hours that the board of health agent is working should be consistent with the rest of the hours of the town hall. We are closed on Fridays. Right. So that I, I don't want to create a situation where it's confusing for the public if we can help it. Oh yeah. Good no, point. he can re he can repost that. Yep. He, well, we talked about that. by appointment, just like other departments. So mm -hmm. that's yeah, that's right. By appointment. Yep. Okay. Sounds good. Um, we have minutes to approve. So um i went through and read the minutes we've got um there's one i'm gonna hold on but um i would recommend holding on december 14th right yeah that one i want to just dig through a okay. little bit further but um yep so i'd make a motion to approve the minutes for october uh 19th 2022 i'll second that any further discussion all those in favor Tim Ilchi, aye. Trevor McDaniel, aye. Carolyn Ness, aye. And then make a motion to approve the minutes for October 25th, 2022. I will second that. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Tim Hilchi, aye. Trevor McDaniel, aye. Carolyn Ness, aye. Thank you. And then the um, November 2nd, 2022. I'll make a motion to approve those. I'll second that. All those in favor? Oh, you have second. All those in favor? Tim Hilchi, aye. Trevor McDaniel, aye. Carolyn Ness, aye. Thank you. And then uh, make a motion to approve the minutes for November 9th. I will second that. Okay. All those in favor? Tim Hilchi, aye. Trevor McDaniel, aye. Carolyn Ness, aye. Thank you. And then a motion to approve November 16th, 2022. I'll second that. All those in favor? Tim Hilchi, aye. Trevor McDaniel, aye. Carolyn Ness, aye. Wait, uh, next one would be November 30th, 2022. I'll make a motion to approve those. I will second that. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Tim Hilchi, aye. Trevor McDaniel, aye. Carolyn Nessa, aye. Thank you. And then lastly would be December, uh, make a motion to approve December 7th, 2022. I will second that. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Tim Hilchi, aye. Trevor McDaniel, aye. Carolyn Nessa, aye. Great. And then we'll just take some time and read through the 14th and I didn't get all the way through that. And then we can approve that maybe next meeting or however we go. I just would yeah. like council to look at it. I yeah. Think. We'll just make sure it's, it's okay. accurate. Um, all right. So I just wanted to go through that a little bit. Okay. And Thank I, you I'm all. I'm happy to say that we're approaching contemporaneous approval of minutes. <laughs> so uh, we won't get behind again. Yeah. I'm so thrilled. Thank you, Chris. And Alex and anybody who's been working on these minutes, I it's a lot of work and I'm very appreciative. We Alex Hershen has done an incredible job and we appreciate it as well. Very much. It's just great to see. Um, so uh, let's see, next item, discussion items we have tonight. Uh, first is the Ad Hoc Human Rights Committee um, consideration of appointments. There's been eight applicants so far um, and the letters are are in your packet, I believe, or most of them are in here. Uh, we have Robin Maislin, uh, Grant Black, um, Hannah Yaffe, Deborah Yaffe, uh, Jennifer Bartek, Sean Durrett, Dave Wolfram, and Charlene Galinsky. So I guess um, just picking up on comments um, at public comment was kind of a discussion of why we're doing this and who we're putting on it and why we're putting them on it. Um, <laughs> and we're going to discuss that a little bit. So I think, again, my um, my feeling on this committee or ad hoc committee to kind of look at what we're doing here, I think it's very important that it's not just 
people who um, have been perceived to be underserved or have been underserved, but it's it's our whole community because we cannot begin to address inequities in our community when we're all agreeing with each other and we're all on the same page and we're all on the same perspective of, of, an, of a situation. And we may find that everybody on this group here is all on page and all in the same group. But I, I, I think it's vital that, it, you know, Jennifer Bartek reached out and wanted to be a part of this. Um, originally, uh, Jennifer Bartek was a part of the DIG group, but then... Um, Actually, from the very beginning. From the very beginning. When, and, when I was involved. In and I think um, brought um, excellent perspective, kindness, help to that group. Um, but that that private group felt uncomfortable having um, a a, somebody in a position of power on that group. So, um, you know, kind of was asked not to be a part of that group. This cannot happen with this group. This group needs to be every single part of our community needs to be having these discussions. Inclusion means everybody that has a position to play or having a discussion is part of these discussions. Because again, we will wind up with a group that everybody agrees with themselves and we're not addressing the, the core issues of what's going on in this community. Um, maybe not everybody will agree. And that's I think that's the most important thing is that we start to have these difficult discussions. And if we are all agree with each other and we're patting ourselves on the back and we all feel like this is great, um, that we're not solving the problem because we're not hearing from the other side. We're not addressing these issues. Um, I, I don't know. I just well, well, feel strongly about I, that. I, I, I have known Jennifer since she was literally born. And um, I have to say that I can't think of a more wonderful, caring, compassionate, extremely well-trained person with, you know, domestic violence and, and rape and, you know, all kinds of awful things that happen. And so I think she brings to the table what I, I consider extremely important, a, a, you know, the kind of um, perspective, you know, she does work in the police environment, but she brings the perspective of how, how do we make this work? Mm -hmm. The reason why this, we're having an ad hoc human rights committee, and my major concern is we need to make this work in a way that's sustainable, that is any incident is reported to us, and that we have resolution. Mm -hmm. We have to figure out, it doesn't matter how many statements we make, all kinds of stuff, if we don't solve the problem. Mm -hmm. So I want resolution. And you can't, and, and, and there is nothing you can do. Our police are our first responders. And, and if there's an issue with our police, then we are going to have training and we will solve the problem. Mm -hmm. They are who we need rely on in all cases, whether it's an emergency, whether it's just a regular event, whatever. It's extremely important that we make this work. Uh, I am committed to make this work, mm -hmm. but you've got to have perspectives. Like the reason why I think it's wonderful that Dave Wolfram is on board, because he understands the select board's office and municipal government. We have got to figure out a way that all instances are reported, and then we come up with a solution and we follow through. And, and you gotta have people contributing that have a little bit of background to make sure that it works. I mean, that we know what the capacity is right. of municipal government, right. which is not vast. Our municipal government right. is not staffed I, with tons of people sitting around waiting for something to address. Um, it, it is how do we weave this stuff into regular uh, everyday operations and how do we change the culture if there's a culture issue we need to identify exactly what it is and then we fix it mm -hmm. and you know whether we have training uh, you know the natick 
uh, police chief is apparently extremely well, um, you know, regarded with his training programs. I I think the Harvard University new police chief is just fantastic. I would love him to, you know, if we could connect with him and come out. Those are solutions that we could afford and that might work. But, and, and yes, it would be great if we could get a grant for $25,000 and have that wonderful person come out that mm -hmm. you and I saw, Trevor, and we're so impressed with. But the we reality is we that. do not have $25,000 here to have them or whatever it would cost now to have them come and help us. So we got to come up with some solutions that will work. I think we need to have people that are willing to work. I, I think this is a good group that would try to work together and help us be partners in a in a, a way that we could come up with something that would work. But we, tell me when I can speak. You are ready yes. to go. Yes, go ahead. We can. We can be. All right. Ended. Yeah. Uh, so. <laughs> I want to remind everyone the ad hoc committee is going to recommend what the committee should be. Right. And so I have two things to say. I actually agree that I fundamentally think that people who serve in certain specific jobs should stay in those jobs. They should run for office when it's permitted by law to run for office, but we should be very careful about appointing people to committees when there could be perceived problems with people who have a human rights issue coming to the Human Rights Commission because uh, they're you know, they're going to be put into position where they feel uncomfortable. Now, this is an ad hoc committee, so I actually think the inclusion of Jennifer on this, she has training specific to a lot of domestic abuse, et cetera, that might come through this, but this committee is to decide what is the committee that we want in town? So mm -hmm. her her involvement on this level, I think is perfectly fine. And I have, I, I actually would like to say, let's appoint all of these people, give them a time frame to have meetings, come back to us with an advisory thing. I don't think that once the committee is formed, that it's appropriate for the police department necessarily to be involved. They, I think the committee should look and say, which, which um, agencies are we likely to have to liaise with so we identify maybe Jennifer Bartek becomes the liaison to the Human Rights Committee because she's trained in special, specific areas. Um, but that's for the ad hoc committee to decide. There seems to be a, a good a representation of people from uh, the community, Mr. Wolfram, uh, Charlene Galinsky, you know, Sean Durrett. These are all people, all of these, these names seem to me to be good honest, uh, you know, advocates for this and let them go do the job of the ad hoc committee, which is to decide what is the committee that Deerfield needs, come up with the suggestion of the chart, you know, the charter or the language or, or what is their purpose. If their purpose is human rights, it's basically advising the select board on how to address issues that are clearly defined in Massachusetts state law. So they're not here to decide that you know, Joe Smith's going to be nice to Lizzie Smith. Uh, yep. That's a separate issue. You have different political perspectives. You're going to fight about it. Mm -hmm. Human Rights Commission, unless there's a violation involved, is not going to be involved in that discussion. It's not to make people solve all the problems of people arguing with each other on social media. That's not what this thing is about. Mm -hmm. So um, I think the ad hoc committee that I envision is one that's going to come back to us and say, We've spent, you know, good time discussing what is the purpose of this committee. This is our perspective. And then the select board can either accept those recommend recommendations or not. And then we'll have a process of what is the process of, of appointing the people that are going to serve on this committee. So, um, you know, that's my perspective. I love that perspective. It sounds well, I, mean, money I, for me. I think we're all on the same page because this is, like I said, this is to come up with sustainable, actionable kind of things that we're going to be doing. Right. And and uh, so, yeah, I mean, the fact that there there might be a, a presence here that some some uh, that uh, Deborah Yaffe expressed this, this opinion, um, that should be discussed in the ad hoc committee. You know, 
I personally agree with her. I don't think town employees, particularly full-time employees, should serve on appointed boards. I think if, they, if they're legally entitled to run for election and they want to serve on an elected committee and the town elects them, I have no problem with that because that's allowed by law. But I, I just have a, a, a difficulty appointing people who are full-time employees as a select board member. Uh, there are too many potential conflicts, et cetera. I just don't think it's a good policy. Actually, Tim, I have to say that I agree with you. I've already had that problem. I don't think town employees should be on any boards, regulatory boards especially, um, and certainly not um, you know, full-time employees. So we've are, I've already had that stated that opinion. So yeah. So that's just my opinion. I, I I do feel comfortable that all of these people are coming with an honest heart and uh, you know, want to do you know, do something that's meaningful for the town in this area. So um I think it'd be nice to get them allow them to get to work and uh, come back to us, you know, in a month's time with uh, solid recommendations. I know they've they've already done some preliminary work. And uh, I'm sure that if we get, you know, if we if we sick them on this tonight, they'll come back in a month's time, and we'll we'll have something that we can consider and uh, move forward on. But anyway, I'm done. Thank you. I, I think actually we're all agreeing here. So actually, I will make the motion that we appoint um, all the applicants, all eight applicants. And I'd second that. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Tim Hilchey, aye. Trevor McDaniel, aye. And Carolyn Ness, aye. And the, the only other thing that I would think we should do is to um, charge. Yeah, ask them to, uh, you know, call a first meeting, figure out uh, some sort of structure for how they're going to run it and who's going to be. I think we should um, ask Chris. Nolan to send out a doodle poll um because you you know just the admit admin part of it to get started and then people can figure out Chris would you be willing to do that sure yeah I'll definitely contact all eight of them make sure they know they were appointed and help them kind of get the ball rolling on that okay. yeah because they're administratively they haven't organized so most of the time the quote unquote administration reaches out and lets them know, okay, this meeting's been posted, you know, and you need to organize because usually that's the second item on the agenda. Well, yeah. And then they true. and then once they've had their first one or two meetings, they can decide who is the point person that could post meetings or whatever. Sounds but good. I, I, I really would appreciate you getting them started because I think that's going to be you don't want to waste any time on that. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'd like to thank everyone for their interest. I know that some people weren't able to attend the meeting tonight, but uh, appreciate your willingness to to take this on. Yeah, it's good work. Okay. Um, next item, there's some sewer abatements, which um, generally we don't have abatements because they're they're summer stuff, unless there's been a um, you know, everybody was, gets an abatement already. On, on... I'm confused as well. So I just, I want to look at these. I haven't had a chance to look at them yet. So okay. bear with me a second. And um, uh, let's see. So first one is, um, so this one was the recalculate my bill for a single family owner occupied within 125% of winter usage. The upstairs apartment has been vacant since no water, no sewer usage. So I, apparently she, I mean, I think she would need to um, register her, her own place as it's not having an apartment, right? This is for single family owner occupied. So if she is, a, if the house is zoned as a single family owner occupied, she would qualify for that, for that amount, correct? Um, I'm just a little bit confused on that. So generally people get, uh, what I need to do is just go back and look at this property. Did she, did this property already get the 125%, um, right. you know, no more than 125% of, of the usage. Um, 
And then if not, um, it, it, we can't just guess who's in an apartment this year and not an apartment this year. So that there needs to be something with the assessor's office that says this is not a dual, it's a single well, family home, right? Right. I mean, I, I think she's being assessed as, I, I wasn't it's, clear what the classification was. Okay, so, so let's get the classification. Let's right. do some research for her and, and make sure that I think she's being assessed correctly or it's not. A family home, but yeah. I, I'm not sure. If so. it is not, then, you know, if she, if she truly is in a single family home and, and, and she didn't get the abatement, we need to make sure she got that. Yeah. And if not, have her decide whether she wants to continue on as a two family or I don't know, I assume it's a two family or a single family. So. Yeah, I don't understand um, underlying. Is there a different rate for a a, a two family or a multifamily? Yes, she would have been charged to, to hook up. Okay, yeah. so this is a question of being charged as to a minimum charge or something right. for, and then the rest of it's based on usage. Right. So this is not one of those instances where the toilet's been running twenty four seven. Right. And, Correct. And she's just had a lot of water so, use. That's right. There's no error. She, she's not going to rent out the apartment. Right. Then her second co connection to me legitimately would be discontinued. And sure. it's only one service connection of a hundred dollars here, right? So. But she's saying that she. She's getting it twice. Twice, I guess. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. yeah, I mean, I, I, I think probably that this should be referred. Is there somebody other than us that this should be referred to nope. to determine, like, uh, is this a two family? Is is oh, it we'll, not a two family? No, it's just us. So we'll just check with, um, we'll check about the uh, abatements because we can see by the address did she get an abatement, and then I can check with them, um, and I'll report back mm -hmm. next meeting. Okay. I'll check with Karen on this and I'll, see I'll how it. All you have to do is be. check yeah. and see if we'll know right away. Yeah. Um, the next one is is uh, for Eric uh, and Elizabeth Brown. They were asking for a reduction in usage because they fill the swimming pool, but that's that is exactly what the 125 percent thing is for for people who water lawns and it, you, you don't pay um, you don't pay for filling the pool. You only pay 125 percent over your winter usage. No you don't pay what. any more of that. So right. you could fill five swimming pools. You're never going to get charged for any more than 125% of your previous winter usage. So I just will research back and make sure that she's getting the rebate already uh, that's already been in there and that um, that it's calculated correctly and, and it makes sure that it's no more than 125% of her last um, usage because looking at the bills... Um, I mean, it's only, uh, I mean, in 2021, it was 75,000 gallons in in um, in last spring, which was winter usage, was um, 32,000. It's 35,000 for this year. So it, there's no big spike of water. Um, so I'm not sure. It's all kind of in line with what it has been, except... Um, last cycle in 11 2021 it was double this cost so just got to research that a little bit so i'll i'll i didn't get a chance to but i'll go back and research both of these and um I, I make sure they got the abatement already and um if there's something more they were supposed to get we'll make sure we talk about that okay so the ones that are like 11 october those are like reflecting summer usage right that's and the, correct and the winter usage in the kicks fall in, in the yeah. early fall depending it's when the water department reads the meter mm -hmm. right so sometime in the early fall is you get the summer you know from really basically from may to right. may to whenever mm -hmm. then your winter usage is from wherever whenever the water department reads it in like september october till may yeah right and then your summer usage is capped at 125 percent right. of that winter right that winter number October yep. to May we had some problems because uh, you know a few years ago because the water department was behind in their reading so they were reading in November-ish instead of September October mm -hmm. so the winter reading was really condensed right and then it went through a period of time when they were reading it early and so the winter reading was very longer much longer mm -hmm. So we had problems because the cap, 125% cap was pretty much higher than it was a lot before. Higher. Yeah. So 
it's a fluctuation but for sure. It seems to have been really steady in the last couple of years, few years. So I'd say in the last three years. So I don't think those are any of the issues. And that's just what Trevor will probably research. Yeah. Yep. Is. Okay. Thanks. The readings are fairly consistent. Yep. Okay. So I'll get back to everybody on that. There was the next item was um, there. Uh, let's see. There was some. Um, oh, there was signatures for legislative acts. Uh, um, I make a motion that we approve these here. Yeah. Okay. I just gave them to you, Trevor. There's okay. two versions. There's one version that has your name spelled out. And there's a version that doesn't. And one of the reasons that I'm giving you both versions to sign, and there's two copies of each, is because sometimes the legislature wants to see a particular format, but okay. they don't always tell us that before we send them something. Oh, these are for, for the extension of uh, the police. For office. the approve, yeah, for the acts that were approved by town meeting. Okay. Um, we had. Uh, council draft them because of Carlene being so involved with all three elections. Yep. So this is us catching up and making sure that you sign them so that we can get them out. And we just have to sign them. Okay. And there's also a cover letter that we that actually Trevor would sign Carolyn and Tim, um, nope. the way it was formatted. Just it's a conveyance letter for these um, you want documents. You want us to vote on the cover letter just to have Trevor sign it? If there's consensus of the board, I don't think it's necessary. Okay. I, I would make a motion that we sign the legislative acts oh, and just Trevor will sign the cover letter. Okay. All those in favor? I'll second it. All those in favor? Tim Hilchey, aye. Trevor McDaniel, aye. Carolyn Ness, aye. More here. Let's see. Oh, here. I'll give you these. Now, this is something, this is something different. Oh, this other one is um, so Trevor, oh, a license yeah. renewal. So this is just certifying. So um, this, yes, that's certifying what was renewed oh, the, the, um, and finalized in December. We actually have to send that report out as mm -hmm. soon as we can. The board just needs to confirm that this is what they approved, which yep. you did back in mid-December. And then we have um, we have the Franklin County Council of Governments Collective Purchasing Program 2000. FY. Kevin wanted to talk to you about that. Okay. We also have the buy recycled policy, but I need to make sure it's in that signature pile. So you talk to Kevin and I'll look at something. All right. Hey, Kevin. Hello, how are you? Good, welcome. Um, so basically what you got in front of you is um, it's the letter that comes every year from the cog basically stating that I'm allowed to be the signator for um, all of our aggregates, any of our contracts that we picked up through there. I mean, obviously, if it's a major contract, then goes to the board, but these are just the standard uh, boilerplate we've done year after year after year. Uh, yep. You know, if you want to put Casey's name on there too, uh, it really doesn't bother me. I mean, it's, Fine. it is what it is, you know. Kevin, um, I'll make a motion to approve um, Kevin as a signatory for the FERCOG. It's the bids, the different bids, right, Kevin? Correct. Okay. Annual bids. Um, do you want to list them, Trevor? The bids? Um, well, there's a... for the motion or no, it doesn't matter. I don't think so. There was um one sec here. Multitasking. And then there's one more here. Yeah. Chris, the document's published in the um packet. Packet. So people can see what it is, Trevor. Okay, and that was for um, it's for highway bids, right? Yeah, we, yeah we, correct. We, yeah, ba basically, it's, it's for our aggregates. So it's yeah. like for stone and sand, Cold and uh, you know, uh, uh, you get culverts, your... uh, pipe, um, fabric, anything, any commodity that I use um, through the highway department is is basically what gets bid on. Roadways, asphalt. Different materials. Um, Guys, we're not, we didn't sign this one. Either. It's the A to Z, what we do. Okay. So um, there's one spot for the select board, and then these others are would be Kevin would sign and Casey, is that right? Or, or, or the rest right. of the board? 
These are uh, select board mayor of the town of Deerfield. I put Deerfield. There's a signature and a date. And then if required, there's four more signature spots. Maybe we all just sign it. Casey, Casey did you hear what Trevor was at? <laughs> Th this has a spot for the select board or mayor. I put the town of Deerfield and we can put the date. And then there's if required, there's four more spots. Should we just all three sign or no? Just you don't necessarily have to if you want to. I mean, they write their contracts like this all the time. Okay. So make, sometimes it's actually been questioned by other town administrators because often town administrators are authorized to do something like this. What you're doing is confirming with them that you're authorizing Kevin to be the signatory for these things. So okay. if Trevor, if it's okay for by consensus for Trevor to sign that, I don't see because you guys usually talk about these things in the meeting. Yep. No, it's fine. All it's right. Fine with me. So you know, and and the other side of the coin is is. I mean, well, the bids are the bids. So whether you accept it or I accept it or Casey accepts it, um, that's really all it is, is we're accepting the their bids. Uh, these fee, the fee schedule. Yep. Okay. Correct. Jeez, I'm missing all of them tonight. No, I didn't. I didn't never, Did I miss one of those? No, no, I didn't ever see this. I just. You got that one. That one's done. Yeah, that it. one's done. Okay. Make sure we're all signed. A lot of different materials I go through in a year. Yeah. Oh, that I, one's I missed done. these. You did, uh, and then sign. Oh, that sign that. That. Yep, that was all our our permits. I'll just sign this here. I forget how to spell my names. <laughs> you sign it after a while. Yeah. This is another okay. one. I sign. Okay. All right. This one's done. Great. This one's done. This one's done. This one is. I don't think you need to. No. I think that one's done. That one's done. This one's done. Yeah. This is the cover letter that's yeah. done, and then we have this one here, which is the recycling one. Right. Did we vote that one yet? No. No. We didn't okay. Vote so this. that's the next item on the list. Kevin, right? would you what um, you're recommending the recycle by recycle? Yes. Yes. Um, I mean, we're we're allowed to use different funds, so it's not like it's it's. Um, taxpayer money that we're utilizing for a lot of these that we're able to pick up we're able to utilize our recycling yep. okay. okay it also Not, confirms no. what dep requires us to do in terms of notification about risk using recycled products sorry so I'll, I'll make a motion. a motion for um by recycled policy approval a second all those in favor tim hill gi trevor mcdaniel i carolyn ness i thank you It's one, right? Yep, I think that's it. Mm. Uh, done. So, okay, okay. thank you. Yep, I think we're done with signatures. Um, the next item is uh, we're going to talk a little bit about. FY 2024 budgets. Um, we have uh, a small list of them here. These are kind of the ones under our review so so far, right? Is that the idea, Casey, or is it just what she had so far, or what you guys? This have? is what has been plugged in. We haven't really talked. She and I haven't sat down and gone over it. Yeah. Um, I wanted the board to have a chance to look at these as a first read. They are due the week of the 23rd, which is the week of your next meeting. Okay. Um, if you have any comments or want to make, want me to specifically put something in there, yes, can, can that you, would be great. But we also, Brenda and I go through these budgets and we're going to, there's some places where I think we may need to consider I, um, additional funds. I can explain them to you, but. I wanted you to have a chance to just look at what the basics are coming you, into this new budget season. Are you posting um, are, are down in Boston for us? Yes, yeah, she. I think she. Oh no, she posted. Yes, we have. Where we're going to post both days? Okay. Um, because we, in the past, we we were. It, it was very successful to meet in the breakfast. Mm -hmm. and, we meet and, and go, and over, go stuff. over this stuff. Yep, we can do that. So if we look at it between now and next week, yeah. And then you post for us in Boston so that we can discuss it over breakfast. I think that would be really good. And okay. Double the select. Chris, board. did you hear that? <laughs> I'm ready. I'm ready for double of the select board salaries. 
people can donate them if they want, but <laughs> uh, I know. Think of how much time you spend a year on this stuff. And it's I know. Well, it's just do we it's all for the good. Have, do we have any um have has any I mean I'm hearing sort of rumors about what's coming from the schools. Do we have any more concrete information? For, well, for capital stuff, um, we do have, um, I can get more information on, on that, but it, they were going to go to the school committee. The capital committee uh, put together stuff to start doing the, the roof, one section of the roof. They're holding off on the driveway at the moment. Um, the garage, they have the tennis courts, but I believe um, a lot of the tennis courts being paid for by e and money, but th I think there will be a request for some money from CPA from CPA for that. Okay. Um, they, um, what are the other items? They're, oh, the boiler. Um, but I think all of that they're going to cover. So there's a, there's a huge amount that they're covering through E and D um, school choice money. They will be asking for some help on some of this other stuff, but and the the roof is the big thing. Like, it's a two million dollar project easily, easily. But we feel like we're going to do the sections that are leaking. We had asked for I think we have like a four hundred thousand dollar budget right now to do it, and you can do like a thinner mill or a little thicker mill of the flat roofing. So we're going to work on the parts that are leaking into the building right now. And I think they're going to need a little bit more money than the 400 to do that section. And then we're kind of like thinking, how much should we do? Like when, it, when is a full remodel of a school do, right? The, the things are 35 years old. I, how old is it since it's been done? At least 25 years. This elementary school is old too. Like Towns usually in 40 years figure out we need a new school. So we should start as a town or a group of towns thinking about what are we doing and maybe we don't do the roof and just redo a remodel of a wing or, but we don't have any land. We need land. Uh, we need to think about long-term, what are we going to do with these expenses coming up? Not that it has to be done right now. I didn't mean to go into a big thing about it, but just we don't want to really do a roof if we're not going to you know what I mean? If you're going to do a whole remodel of a, of a school at some point, but anyways, so they're going to be doing a lot of it. I can get those data once they have their meeting. And if you would get a little bit more information, is that, and you're wondering them? what the budget will be like for the regular education? Well, I, well, I, um, we talked, just talked basically about the board of health budget. Um, the, I talked about the, um, scams I met, uh, talked with Zach today, and um, it looks like 1.9%, even with a 3% COLA, is what it's going to be um, from a budget mm -hmm. operational point of view. The one question we have is, you know, we're on target. Uh, 2023 was the rotation for our ambulance. We have 250000 in for the ambulance, which is what we were saved for. The problem is the cost of replacement for an ambulance is $360,000. So, you know, it's only jumped up in the last year and a half. Right. But so how we got to talk, we meet on Tuesday and we've got to figure out how we're going to um, Can we stretch another year or something. You know, do we, do we just have a different capital? Well, we have to have a different capital approach because obviously you know, working. costs of ambulances are not going to go back down to 250. But how do we um, budget for it for replacement of 2024 if we're not going to do it in 2023? Or if we are going to do it in 2023, how do we make up that $110,000 shortfall? So that's going to be what we'll be right. discussing because that's that's really the issue. Yes. I think, you know, otherwise, uh, the, what we're getting from Medicare has jumped up 6%. So, I mean, our revenues are looking good. Okay. Um, I think we're really stable and, um, you know, it look is looking fine, but, you know. It also the, takes a long time to get an ambulance too. So when you place it, it's important to- I like, know. So that's why we're kind of hesitant. You know, 2023 is our replacement year. So do we put the order in knowing it's probably not going to, 2024. It's going to be 2024. I mean, there's a lot, we got to, 
we got to yeah. think about okay. it. Okay. All right. And you but, mentioned boiler. Um, yep. Just to go back to the school, I, mm -hmm. I understood that there was some talk about different solutions. Yes. So what is this solution that we so, think they're offering? So the school is going to instead, you know, right now they have two gigantic right. um, things. So they're going to do frontier. the same right here. Right. So what they're going to do at Frontier is very similar to what we did over at the elementary school is where we took out the two large ones and did three small ones so they can toggle up and down. So you don't have to, like on a really cold day, you don't have to start up that second really large one when really two smaller ones would do it. And, you know, if you really need the third or something like, and you, they'd rotate them to keep them all in use at, at the same time. But the idea is to kind of, to do that because they looked at repairing and we they were just constantly taking off another fin you know right. because and it was just get the the efficiency was getting way down and they looked at using other um you know other materials but then you're talking a two million dollar project to redo all the infrastructure in the whole building and it just didn't seem worthy right. like if you built a new school you would maybe build something else but right. geothermal that kind of thing but not you know they're just we don't have the cost money for that in this building so i think it's three smaller units and they have proposal out to the school committee to then uh talk about doing and i think mm -hmm. that they've got that covered with okay. e and and i don't think they'll be looking for the town for any of that which would be it's fantastic but yeah so that's that um so this uh, just I was just going to go through these real quick and just have an eye on them. So we have um, select board staff salaries, um, and it looks like we would do a part time admin support was something we would add because that's I think it needed and that's obvious about all the work we're doing. Um, so that is important, and I get that. Um, administrator expense really you haven't filled out anything yet, um, and we're. I have, and I'll start filling the budgets in. Yeah, that's fine. And it's a fairly small budget anyways. And legal expense, um, any news from them, whether they have any changes on their fee structure for Mead and... Um, Not yet. Okay. We usually will find out. Yeah. We usually find out a little bit later. I can see if Lisa can send me. Kind of with all we have going on, I, I wonder. Yeah. Casey, I have a question. Um, that grant that you just got to study, well, that was a 30,000 30, grant mm -hmm. that to talk, is that to look at like staffing needs? What, what's that? I was going to explain it a little bit easier, a little bit later, but it's okay. basically a grant for a, an employment assessment. So we can figure out how we should de be deploying staff. And we added, it was sort of a hybrid application because we added DEI elements to it because I think we need to start recognizing it and figuring out how to plan for it. Okay. So it's not a, it's not one that's going to assess, um, you know, staff needs. Not necessarily. Compu community compact grants are actually one of the easier grants the state provides. Basically what you have to do is report on what you asked. So we did, I did two community compact asks. One was for a personnel manual and one was for this employment assessment with DEI. So what we have to report back to them is basically what we get from the vendor we work with. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. I, I just a lot less work than some of these other grants. Yeah. Because I, I mean, I, I no, I wouldn't have done it if I didn't think I could, I could manage it. But frankly, these are critical needs: the employment assessment and the personnel manual. We've okay. been trying to get a personnel manual done since 2014, Tim. No, no, that's great. And I, I, I was just going to say, I still think at some point we need to get a grant to find out if we have the correct amount of people working in this building because well, that's actually what might help us we might help this might help us sort of inform those conversations yeah because we don't want to lose people because they they're overworked and um yep. so okay thank you and we still have some money in here to buy a rug for these wires <laughs> just have not had the time to actually place the order yet. i was just forever <laughs> we can't do it that way it doesn't allow osha doesn't allow it who doesn't osha osha Who's OSHA? All right. I didn't, I didn't do that. So, all right. You know, my I've gotten quite what for from a certain um, <laughs> superintendent about how that works. 
my appointment on the Maya board advisory yes. Can you board give us some wiggle room? is, is, is going to make this some wiggle room? problematic. <laughs> We actually had put out a request to Wasman to ha give us a refreshed quote on how to rearrange some of that stuff and get some better equipment in. Um, and Chris and I were going to talk about that, but you know, there is one you know, thought of just raising this floor four inches and um, putting all the wiring underneath. That you know that might help us in the meantime. Um, just to Casey, I think that we you know we get the money from Comcast. You know the uh, our fees. That's what I was planning on using, Carolyn. I, I was just going to say, I think even though it's, I think it can be interpreted to cover safety. Oh yeah, it's capital. It's totally capital. Movement to do something here. Well, the problem is, is you've got aging equipment. Jonathan and I, Jonathan and I have talked about this. You've got aging equipment that needs to be replaced. Those microphones are the same ones I bought. I know in 20 and 2005. So we need to have some upgraded um, equipment that actually gives you better sound and that gives better sound, pushes better sound out to the public. Um, and so they had, Wasman had a couple of options, but one of the things that really we need to pay attention to is though, I know we don't want to spend a lot of money on the building while we're considering the 1888 building as a, muni as a town hall or municipal office we still need to be able to conduct these meetings effectively yeah. and not just for the select board, but for all the boards that use the main meeting room. Yeah. I know. So and it's not intended to undermine anything. It's just intended to sort of give us a, a good way to approach it because Waitley did this and, and their meeting room works really well. And um, come March, who knows what we're going to have to do, you know? Usually. That's a subject up for discussion tomorrow in my legislative affairs subcommittee meeting. Will you please make sure that we write letters, have a letter for our next meeting, depending on what you about think. remote? Yeah, mm -hmm. please. Okay. Um, so we have a, a, a request for approval of full time hours for the senior center outreach coordinator, which I could talk to a little bit. So we had um, we had a um, board of oversight meeting at the South County Senior Center. Um, on January 5th and went through, you know, all of the budgets and kind of getting getting our plan together. And um, we felt it was important to increase uh, the outreach coordinator position. Who uh, Chris is involved with that. I was just going to say, Chris is a seemingly a wonderful. He has been wonderful. And what yeah. they've been able to do, um, having the van, getting people to and from appointments, to and from programs. Um, it's really coalescing. I just want to just publicly say how proud I am of Jennifer Remillard and the work that she's done over the last year um, with the with the senior center. Um, and I can't wait until we have a space, but she's been vital about finding space for and advocating for her employees and for her seniors and um, the participation in the programs is just exploding and how many people are coming and enjoying the events that she's putting on and um, the exercise programs and she's always looking for grants and she just was working really hard and I I, I really appreciate Thank that you, Alex. very much and um, so we, we supported this um, it was not a huge stretch of money but we felt thought it was important because it did free up Jennifer to keep doing that other work and it and it allowed him to consolidate his efforts at our one facility. So that's my thought is I would, um, I don't know if we need to take a vote on this. I do believe they went before the personnel board on this, Casey. No, she's going to go, or do we need to go? She's scheduled to go. We're scheduled to discuss this at the, I just submitted a, an agenda for Raloon, who's the chair, to yeah. add this to their next meeting, which is the 23rd. Yeah. Um, and so they, I actually briefed them on this back in November and we, Jennifer and I were trying to settle on certain things and she wanted to discuss with the boo before we really went any further. Yeah. And so she and I sat down and, and worked on finalizing the job description. Yeah, and yeah. so the job description is going to go to the personnel board on the 23rd. I'm giving it to you. And I said to her that I wasn't sure I'd be able to get it ready for tonight, but 
frankly, this gives you the opportunity to read through it because we could put it on your agenda for the 25th and you could approve it then. I'm, I mean, I'm good right now. I, I, I go, I've been a lot closer to it, so I'm, I'm good I am I make a motion it. to support this because I Sounds think good. Chris, and it gives, Chris has been doing an outstanding job. Yeah, and it gives them, um, you know, I, mean, it, I, I think, think it works them before the personnel board. You know, you're not supposed to um, you know, have the, the but, person right. determine what, but he is so great that I, I feel like this is, should be supported. Yeah. I think so too. So is there a normal process? I mean, is it supposed to go to the personnel board? And then yes, the personnel board does have to review it. The reason you review it is because you're the hiring authority as the select board. Uh, one thing I would say is when you look at that, there's, I've highlighted a couple places and if you want me to screen share it, I can. I've highlighted a couple things that I wanted to draw your attention to because in this case, you're seeing a change to supervision and a change to sort of the elements of planning and um, task management, as well as um, acting in the in the manner like kind of like what Chris does. If I'm not here, he acts on behalf of me. Mm -hmm. um, so that is also an element. So that's what I highlighted in the job description for you guys to look at. And that's the job description I will send to personnel. Um, I just wanted to show you those elements if you wanted to talk about them sure. and up to you how you want to handle it. You tell me what you want me to do with it. I'm supportive for it. So I'm supportive approach. of it too. And I think it, it puts them in a better position when they go to the personnel board. So I would yeah, have motion. only final question I have is um, what's the, the FL, FLSA status non-exempt? What's the not exempt? What, what's the advantage of exempt, non-exempt? Uh, um, generally, exempt is department head level or somebody who has significant supervision over, you know, a group. Okay. So that's generally the reason. It's actually, well, the FLSA is is often, there. I shouldn't say often, there are prescribed descriptions for what exempt versus non-exempt are. FLSA means for the general public and me. <laughs> you asked me and now I can't remember. One of those it basically, it basically it's is. It's the Federal Fair Labor Standards Act. Yes, right. thank you, thank you. But yeah. it basically is the person eligible for, a, when you ha say Over exempt, yeah. is the person a contract has a contract or not is eligible right. for a contract non-exempt means they you have to pay overtime right and correct no right right so it's really that overtime versus administrative work and how that's defined um overtime versus you know salary um, okay so i'm i'm in favor of supporting this as well I okay just, so you have a motion motion Can second. second any further discussion all those in favor tim hilchey aye trevor mcdaniel aye carolyn ness aye Great, thank you so much. Um, they'll be pleased. Uh, let's see. The um, we did the signature. We did the signatory. We've got uh, Kevin's done. We've got a authorization of letter transfer station. We have can picking complaints again. Somebody's picking cans again. I thought we had this nailed down. No, no, no. And it, it's more than one resident. So what I'm requesting is is a letter go to these residents and basically explain to them that, that you know, uh, if you want to go underneath the bylaw, it's 219.8, um, yep. stating that, you know, nobody's supposed to be taking stuff out. Long story short is, is, is they've been talked to in the past. They're, it's it's not being effective. I'm requesting a letter come from the board, basically stating stop or you're going to be trespassed. Yep. Period. We're we're getting way too many complaints. I'm getting way too much on my head, and it's not worth it to me anymore. No, you know, I, I I understand what they're doing, you know, and they're not trying to be mean or or anything else. But the bottom line is, is they're not supposed to do it, and we're getting complaints, and I got to do my job. And it's they're just, not listening to me, so they need to listen to you. If they don't listen to you, then they listen to the police department. Yep. Great. I'm done. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. We've had we've asked in many times for this to stop, and um, years. Years, not weeks, months, literally years. Yes. Yep. So I have, I, I'm, I'm done. Like, why is this all? But it, it is actually, it it's thefting from the town because it reduced, you know, that's money to the town when we right. 
recycling. It's not just free. Like it's not just getting thrown in the trash. So if people don't want to pick them out and put, you can, you can take them out and walk them five feet across the parking lot and dump them in the, in the recyclables. And those are helping the town. So they, the library, I think turns some of that uh, benefit other, other entities, you know, gain money from that. If people want to donate their recyclables, they can do that there. But returnables, when, returnables, not recyclables. Yeah, return don't put your recyclables over there. They don't yeah. make any money on that. When they go into the, well, I, I call them that because it's, you know, that's what they were, but they, um, but when returnable bottles in the, in the old salt shed, there yeah. are containers there that will benefit the uh, library is my understanding. Yep. Yes. Okay. Right. All right. Anything you need to add, Casey? Or I just wondered if we write the letter, um, would the board be amenable to having Trevor sign on sign on behalf of the board or Kevin, do you want all three people to sign? It, it doesn't matter to me. I, I think chair only would be sufficient. That's completely a, whatever you, your protocol would like to be. That we authorize the letter and that we authorize Trevor to sign the letter. Okay. Or authorize Trevor's stamp to be used. Yeah, that's fine too. <laughs> <Our stamp. laughs> More than welcome to do that. All three, if you want. So um, I'll second it. All those in favor? Tim Hilchi, aye. Trevor McDaniel, aye. Carolyn Ness, aye. Thank you for bringing that up. And Excellent. Thank you. You know, I didn't, you know, it is what it is. Yep. I'd like to have Kevin put some language in there, though, because colorful language, I, I think that would be, <laughs> makes <laughs> it a little more interesting to read. Yeah. We can definitely refer to the bylaw. That helps. So yeah. yeah. the next item is really, um, we- Thank you. We've thank been, thank Kevin. you, Kevin. Thanks, Kevin. We've been working with um, uh, DPC and, and DEP about the sewage notification um, process, SSO, I think it was called. Um, so what happens is if we have a failure or massive storm or for some reason um, untreated sewage goes through one of our plants and into the river, we need to notify specific people in a specific manner and we needed to have all of this plan laid out and accessible on our website and um, phone tree and all that work so uh, dpc helped us with that we did everything we turned it in dep found that we um, hadn't quite finished um, making things accessible on our website uh, Chris had been working on that with Casey and others, and they have, I think, completed everything. I got an email today saying that, or a text that everything was done. Um, Chris can explain. Yeah, go ahead, Chris. You did a great sure. job. Being Pat. Thank you. So, um, yeah, Pat and I, we were able to contact Civic Engage and submit a ticket because what we found was a lot of towns with similar websites to ours had a page specifically where users could go enter their email address and phone number and automatically enroll themselves in the sanitary sewer overflow notifications. We had a certain privacy setting enabled that you needed to sign in with an administrative role on the website in order to make changes to subscriber lists. Oh, okay. um, so we were able to adjust that. I got an email today from somebody at Civic Engage saying that they fixed it for us and I tested it not logged on, anybody can go on there now, enter their phone number, email, whatever they want to receive the alerts on, and it should work for them fine. That's great. Is this Thank a you new very much. It is a new requirement this okay. year. And so we've been working and trying to get it all I was laid just out. Say, this has not been one of the emergency things that I've worked on in the past. Right. And then uh we we hooked in um Alex, you know, and um, you know, obviously uh, Eric at the at the plant. So everybody's got the plan. It's in our operations manuals. Because I, you know, ever since we had Irene, when the Greenfield plant was inundated and they were dumping like a million gallons a day into the Green River, that of course dumped into the Deerfield River. Right. And you know, I had a panic call in the middle, literally yeah. in the middle of the night when that happened. So, um, you know, we had set up sort of procedures, but. Mm -hmm. So this is this, this is, is wonderful because yeah. then, then it's like you don't have to really worry. It's about done. It. So you, you when it happens, you know what you do. You send out the stuff. You contact the people. You notify the the um, you know, like twenty two news and like all the people down the river. So everybody, you know, if it happens up north, they notify us. I you mean, know, we it's all in the dark flagging, before, right? Flagging people in canoes out of the river, right? And telling them. Yeah, you know, you got to get out. You got to get out. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so this will be. This is really good. This will be good. Yeah. So I think all that's right. all set. And then 
Um, so the only question I have is did and then do do we as of now can we get this? However, it's got to be on our website. Can we get a notification back to DEP that we're done, or have them reevaluate re us? I don't know how that works, but somehow if we could follow up on that email to DEP and make sure that they're good with yeah yeah to submit cor corrections, I guess is here. So perfect. Yeah. So as long as we get get on that, that'd be great. Thank you. All that certainly appreciate it. Okay. Um, we don't have any general appointments, so I don't, I don't see any mail. So, town administrator report. Do we have this one piece of mail? Oh, do we have a record to Trevor? Oh, what is it? It's it's a letter oh. from Janet Kellogg. Yes, I spoke to uh Janet Kellogg, I did get her contact and her number, and I called her and explained Explain. it to her. She was thrilled that she got a phone call, thrilled that she's not getting a bill. Um, and we're all good. Okay. So that that's been handled. And, and, and she was did you have to have discussed the 25% tax that everyone pays? I did. I did explain yeah. that and she understood that. Okay. And yeah. uh and but she she was fearing that and there was this rumor before around town meeting that um yeah. we had all decided to send all users in town or non-users in town like a five thousand dollar bill to pay for the sewer project. Yeah. I have no idea where that came from, but it's not true. So if yep. that if you're thinking that's happening, it's not happening. So um, just nothing. Nothing's changed since we did that. So. Good. Um, so Casey, I know, um, you know, like this. Oh. The today, the MVP um, meeting wasn't posted. Um, can we, you know, so can we just ask Chris to post certain committee meetings? like the MVP pro meeting? Well, that was my question is it used to be a work group and now it's being referred to as a committee. If it's an appointed committee, it has to be posted. So is it work, well, do we have Well, I think the reason, the reason why we had a uh, posting issue was because Carolyn and I are both on it. So, okay. so the, 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 the way we got around it today was that Carolyn didn't attend the meeting. Yeah, I, yeah I, so it has to be posted if you're both attending. Right, I just emailed my comments in instead of going to the meeting and- okay. But I think, you know, if we can like post for sure MVP meeting, you know, the meeting tomorrow, I see that the meeting tomorrow is posted. So that's mm -hmm. fine. Yeah. Um, can you just make sure that we have postings at the MMA meeting? Yes. Chris and I are, we had talked about that. We're going to, we're going to have to add the budget item. So not... we'll have to repost. Did I don't, which day did you want to do it? Friday or Saturday? For well, budgets? Friday, well, I'm, I'm on that panel in the morning. So we're not going to be able to do Friday morning. Um, okay. So Saturday morning. So it would be Saturday morning. Okay. Okay. Um, DTOA. Yeah. So one thing I'd like to, if we're going to do my report, um, I wanted to bring up something that came through my email this morning or this afternoon, I got an email from Stan Adams. He mentioned that um, I guess the board was supposed to discuss displaying the time capsule in the municipal offices. I didn't know that, so it wasn't on the agenda. He mentioned that to me at the gala, and yes, I, I, I said, yeah, that's a great idea. We should we should show it, you know, have it on display here because it was in the in the gala. Right. Um, I, I'm good with that if everyone's good with that. Um, okay. Yeah, we just need to find a place to put it. So if the board's all good with that, we'll have to, it's it's stored right now, but we can pull it out and put it out. The But the other issue is we have to find a way to display it um, okay. so that people have a chance to walk around it and look at it. Well, just, we, just one point to bring out too is um, uh, we have a, well, there's going to be like a movable or mobile display of men mem memorabilia um like chris harris's family has donated quite a bit and different families have donated stuff and mm -hmm. so peter thomas was going to come up with something that we can have in the town hall and then move it around when we have events and mm -hmm. stuff so i just wanted to make sure also that you guys are okay with that yeah, yeah. what i would recommend is cleaning out and getting accessibility to that beautiful cherry case yeah. getting rid of all those junk chairs let's get them over to the church or wherever because we don't use them we have this beautiful statue chair you know cherry glass case statue why don't we set get a nice table 
and set it up there so that everything is right around that corner. Yeah, no, that's a really great idea. Well, we do have to keep in mind that there are activities that happen on a monthly basis where we use the main meeting room. So yeah. that's what I mean about sort of managing how, nobody how we display it. And yes, cleaning up that area is, you know, nobody's actually said we need to get rid of all those chairs. So I'm just there's several we know we need to get rid of. <laughs> yep, let's get rid of all that let's stuff. At least, at least get rid of the, the broken ones. Yeah, to the church. Yep. Okay. Trevor. Yep. Chris Harris had a has a question. Yeah, so um, the other alternative or a balancing act in terms of how much space you need there is is that <clears throat> I know Stan and Marie Thomas are already looking at the windows at the um, drugstore. I don't know what the name of it is. They're in the center of town because they're good display windows. So they're thinking of putting some things in there too. Hmm. Okay. And then no, the people don't need to go inside. They can look at it from the outside. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Sounds good. Sounds wonderful. All right. All right. I shall move on. So yeah, like I mentioned earlier, we received two community compact best practices grants to develop a personnel manual and for the employment assessment that includes diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we'll start we'll start investigating vendors. It may be useful. I know that um, Collins Center does the personnel manual work. And we could actually see how they would approach an employment assessment. So, because that's one of those places where we don't have to do um, a procurement because they're a, they're a state vendor. So we can sign a contract with them for that work. So I had actually gotten some help from Mary Accardi to finish the submission to the community compact program because we didn't have a fully fledged scope. Allison, Denise, and I worked on this. We didn't have a fully fledged scope for the employment assessment, but we had a basic description of what we planned to do. So I just wanted to let you know that that's out there. Um, DLTA forms came in. Yes. This is due the 27th. Yeah, so we... for purposes of what you're seeing right now, it's sort of a first read situation. I wanted you to have a printout of them. Um, and we need to be careful and, and thoughtful about what everyone pursues because there's some there's some opportunities coming up. Like I don't know, I haven't I haven't drilled into all of the each item, but we had a cog meeting with the Franklin County town administrators. And one thing that Linda mentioned um, sort of on the tail end of that DLTA request or confirmation that the request had gone out um, is the COG is exploring grant writing services and assisting towns, particularly with state and federal grants, because it's really become apparent that a lot of towns don't have that resource. So Linda was nice enough to mention that to us at this point, because it's sort of pre budget work. Um, I also sent the DLTA request to the planning board because typically the planning board has may want some input or has some ideas they might want to pursue as well. Um, the other one of the things that we should look into is uh, the new cybersecurity agency on the state level, what they're going to do and not do, and then that and what Homeland Security is trying to fill some of the gaps, and then what do we have left? Because, you know, I think we need to keep reviewing our, you know, IT people. That actually, something sort of adjacent to that came up in the deal, in the TA COG meeting today. Um, there's actually a lot of money that's going to be coming out through MBI for digital equity. Um, and so sort of the, the two... Digital equity means access. Um, right. Our cybersecurity, if if access is in, if, if access like hotspots in public buildings, is that is actually a goal in this program? Um, if that happens, then we need to make sure that our cybersecurity is tight, Carolyn. So you're right. Going to the cybersecurity groups, especially if they're at the vendor, if they're on the vendor floor at the MMA conference, that would be really helpful because we can get some more information about the new agency and how to work with it. Um, the planning committee meeting we had a couple of weeks ago, or, or last week, excuse me, I'm lose, 
you know, my calendar is so crazy. But last week, we're trying, we're sitting on about um, $120,000 that we're trying to support towns with. And um, I, so I don't know, we've, we've got to sort out what the state is doing. It's not clear because this is a brand new agency. Yep. So we're from the Homeland Security point of view, we're going to fill the gaps. And then, then we need to fill whatever's left. And so I, we really got to sort this out, Casey. You know, I can't stand this stuff. It drives me. I know, but we have so many other projects, Carolyn. It's hard to. I know. I know. Every time we have a meeting, there's instructions and projects to follow up on. So, you know, we just, and I really, we have to deal with cybersecurity. It's just how we deal with it and assigning that particular project should we need to be thoughtful about how we do that well i keep going to meetings you know that i know, I know. but it's pretty pathetic to me be the one in charge let me tell you of that so can i ask a question while we're talking sure. about um you know I'm, i assume everybody will look through the dtla and yeah. stuff and then we we do the, our, our thing i was I was wondering about the master plan. Is that something that we have to do or is that in the works? I know we did open space, but the master plan is- The master up. plan is overdue. Um, it's very overdue. Yeah, Carolyn. The, a, the problem is when I was involved in the first two, the original one, we did ourselves 100%. Then they had more requirements and we got a small grant and we did it with the FERCOG. Mm -hmm. And now it's way beyond us. You have to actually have a consultant yeah. and you have to do this whole thing. What's, it's it's really tough. And that's why we didn't renew it because it's so expensive. We're going to need to, right? Right. Yeah. We do need to. It actually is going to inform a lot of the, the upcoming things that the town's going to have to address. So I had asked the planning board to think about that several months ago. And I, I have a meeting with Anna Lee, but... It may be that they need to, in their budget submission, consider putting some money towards a master plan. We may be able to get some help through DLTA funds. That's yeah. one of the specialties of the COG. So yeah. that's one of the reasons I wanted the planning board to look at it because this master plan has been on everybody's mind for a while. It is. Well, it expired. At, well, ours, our last one was 2010. Right. So, so we're overdue. But to, it go. goes 10 years. So mm -hmm. it's expired in 20. So it's three years past due. That would be one of mine. And then because um, that's policy. That's going to be one of the things, just like the hazardous mitigation plan, mm -hmm. you know, why we have to renew that every five years, because that's the minimum requirement to qualify for grants. Yep. So yep. same thing with the open space and rec plan. Yeah. So for me, it's master plan. It's um, rural policy plan implementation and fostering municipal engagement. Well, the but, uh, rural, um, my understanding from the planning, the planning conference committee that um, was a Monday mm -hmm. that Tim and I um, went to, um, the rural, uh, you know, the rural at group yeah. is coming together with their um, recommendations in what, in the next, in the next six weeks, right, Casey? Yeah. Okay. So from in that six week period, once we find out that will, you know, tell us some of them are, we're, we're way out of sync with, mm -hmm. for us because of it being in the Valley. Correct. But, but depend. I think now they're going to be all school. The majority of them are going to be school related yeah. and housing related yeah. based on my just mm -hmm. for rural policy, Carolyn. Yeah, there's it's a lot broader than that. That's actually a conversation we're having tomorrow in the legislative affairs subcommittee. Okay. But it's I, very those, broad. Those are the two primary topics. Yep. And so I'm not sure it I mean we want to support that because I mean that would be a good in, implementation for us because we we need to coalesce around requirements for mm -hmm. school more school funding. Right. So. Oh for sure. So, so you, I mean, I'm I, I'm okay yeah. with that, Casey, as being a pro. No, I think that's a good thing. And, you know, all of them. Right. But there's a lot of things that they've been talking about, like pilot payments and a bunch of subjects. Well, pilot payments is always on there. But the problem is we, our yeah, pilot, the only pilot order, payment like we, we really get is for um, what something else sugar loaf. And it's pretty, right. and then it's they go pretty minimal. Right. 
So that's not a big deal for us, but what we need is more money for schools. And so somehow we, I mean, we're, we're shouldering the, the cost of the whole county because we're, you know, have so much school choice. Frontiers is, I mean, is high, high percentage now of school choice. And we, you know, that you can't be doing that time. without some more additional we funding. With this, we agree with that. We agree with so that. that's got to be one of the discussion items. And that the whole formula, good. you know, the it's pothole money, they get, when they come up with the pothole money in in April and May, they usually throw some out to us. But it's real again, it's really minimal amount of money. And we need some more support. So I'm, I'm, in, I'm in favor of that, Trevor. Okay. Just based, on, I mean, we won't know for sure what that what yeah. the stuff is for another six weeks or so. But right. I would say it's probably going to be stuff that we're interested in. Okay. So that I mentioned the digital equity grants. Um, MBI is is the agency that the feds are going to push money through for, and they have planning grants and they have other types of money that's going to come through, and it's significant. Um, Linda asked everybody at the TA meeting this morning um, whether towns would whether towns would be interested in coming up with a regional plan for that. And the COG is actually a consultant on that contract to help develop things like this. So the towns would have to apply directly to be able to reach out to a consultant and start discussing it. But she threw it out there because there's a lot of towns that don't have bandwidth to do some of this stuff. And because the, the COG is, a, is an accepted vendor on that contract, they have a unique ability to listen to what the COG towns, what Franklin County towns really see as, as concerns. And so many of the town administrators were interested in pursuing that. I just wanted to let you know. And I, I did give you a printout of the slides from the last information session on digital equity. So you had a chance to look at it. Um, and I had found it after, I actually went looking for it after the meeting this morning. Um, the other, there was one other thing, and I think I forgot to write it down. Um, I might just have to send you an email. <laughs> That's fine. Don't worry about it. There's so much. We're going to be meeting tomorrow anyway. Remember? Yeah. Yeah. All right. That's. There was one other thing, and I didn't write it down, so I apologize. I will try to advise you all. <laughs> there's been Forty other things you've given us beforehand. So. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, annual town meeting. So, Julie. Shelfont and Brenda and I had talked about this um, because the governor's budget and the school budget are basically coming in about the same time. Um, there's a request out there to consider um, pushing town meeting or continuing town meeting. I just wanted to let you know that I've reached out to Lisa about it and to Dan um it was it would probably be a function the select board would have to deal with um i don't have more information right this second but it's out there as a conversation because if the governor's budget isn't out and the school budget's due in march they may not have a lot of time to parse everything that needs to change so i just want everybody to understand i don't know if darius has mentioned that to you trevor but he's mentioned yeah. it to the town administrators um yeah. now that we've moved our um fireworks and parade until June 17th. We do to have June 10th available. Okay. Or um, moving, I'm, I'm in favor of moving it just so that it takes the pressure off mm -hmm. of a fall, special fall town meeting because it doesn't make sense for us to rush in with the budget and then vote the budget and then have the governor's budget come in and be totally different. Yeah. Well, it could be that we start annual town meeting, but maybe post um, continue it. So I've asked both those questions that one of the answer, one of the comments I got back from um, Lisa sort of confused me. So she and I have to talk about it again. I just wanted to bring it up as sort of a tickler item to keep in the back of your heads. I was supportive of that because, you know, I brought that up months ago when, you know, we thought we weren't going to get a budget. Right. Yeah, I it, 
she, you know, the governor has, as a new governor, the governor can turn in the budget late because they need time to prepare it and review all the revenues. So, you know, I didn't expect it to be March, but it's really a question of having enough time to review and consult and see what consult with the superintendent. General, it's just in general that having an April town meeting just doesn't make sense anymore. Because yeah, that's actually Julie and I had talked about that, and I'm pretty sure Julie might have mentioned it to you guys individually. Um, we discussed it because considering how how the picture changes between April and July, yeah, it really may be worthwhile considering changing town meeting but keep in mind the town meeting and the election go hand in hand so if we push one we have to address pushing the other one yep and we could set it up the same way we we do now a monday meeting with a monday election it's just moving it into may is is maybe a really good idea at this point point. and the other issue is like right you know you're looking at the at the capital you know the the budget schedule and, and this is about the time we start to really think about okay what products projects can we do we don't even know how much money we'll have i mean there's no. so much that we really don't know until you get into february and march that you really are like okay we're coalescing around this but it's way too late to put in a capital thing and then we upset capital because we're like oh we figure we have some money for this or money for that and oh we need to put this back in it's just it gets too crammed early on and not enough information till a little later. And it just, because everyone's coming off of holidays and then we're just getting to MMA to see what's new, what's going on. And it's hard to kind of do all that budgeting early. It is. And so that's one of the things that was an observation from Julie. Yeah. Okay, great. That's good. Sounds like we're all on the same page. So we're happy. Yeah, to I think so. It just, we need to, and Julie actually wrote an article. I thought that was so cool. She wrote okay. an article to make the change and we would have to sort of parse it. But frankly, yeah. I think we need to think about that just because it's becoming more and more difficult to settle a budget. Even yeah. though the requirements June 30th, it's becoming more and more difficult to settle a budget early on. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Anything else anybody have? No? I entertain a motion to adjourn. I make that motion. Second. <laughs> all those in favor. Tim Hilchey, aye. Trevor McDaniel, aye. Carolyn S. Aye. Thank you all very much. Have a great Chris, night. Thank you for